and we are live with doug mckenzie how you doing man the real doug mckenzie the real one there is there is a couple right i was wondering that's i was i was gonna ask and obviously it's a stupid question but like uh you started making a presence and then you you went online and found out that you're not the only one on the planet is that what happened there no that whole that bob and doug mckenzie thing man that's been a thing forever oh, right everybody asking me like hey do you have a brother named bob uh no my, my brother's name actually his middle name is robert so i guess i i kind of do but yeah that's uh that's always been a thing okay i didn't put that together but i'm happy, that we've, <laughs> I'm happy now, that we've, now it's really out there yeah no kidding oh that's too funny dude um yeah, I mean, I came across, uh, you were mentioned on the podcast a long time ago. Mm-hmm. And then um, it came across the stories and and you had found it and put the snippet online. And I was like, that's super exciting. And then I started looking into what you're doing. And it was like, you got to come on, dude. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's super funny because one of my first questions is always like, have you been on a podcast before? And this morning you did Nick's. Yeah. If, if I knew that we could have spread it out couple of days no i put them together i've got man my my schedule is so packed so i'm like i'm a crammer right (laughs) yeah i mean if you're gonna if you're gonna take an afternoon to do stuff like just ram as much desk stuff as you can in yes and i'm like set up in the office the lights the microphone camera everything's set up so like why not just get it get it over and done with yeah totally dude uh, and do it you know it's a nice office you got thank you you're very welcome you're very welcome um kind of wanted to talk about like where you guys like so where are you from where do you live it's a lot specifically no no specifically. yeah <laughs> it's, it's a loaded question right now i'm in Kelowna, bc okay my company is in Coburg, ontario okay i i grew up in bob cajun you know small little town tragically hit. yeah i grew up there then i was in uh Coburg for like the last i think 10 12 years something like that yeah. And I've been in Kelowna for the last year. Yeah. It's dope out there. I spent Super some time nice. in BC the last couple of years and I've, I've really enjoyed it. Yeah. We, we fell in love and like when we were younger, you know, all of our friends did the out West thing. Everybody traveled out West and went and worked yeah. in the oil rigs and things like that. And I had the drywall business, so I never got to go. Yeah. I always stayed back. I had the business since I was 20. So I never got to do that trip. I'd actually never even been out West. And then I came here a couple of years ago for a fishing trip and like fell in love. And then I came back because my my wife has some family here. And the business was to a point, especially through COVID that I was like doing the work from home, everything's through a laptop kind of thing. Cause I had PMs and stuff like that. So I wasn't on site. So we're like, Hey, let's, uh, let's, let's try this. And uh, we literally loaded in our RV and drove out here. Did the big trip. Was there a buffer period at the beginning where you were just like, cause you've worked with Steve, right? That's, I think that's the podcast that you were brought up on. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think, Steve Russell. Yeah. And I think you taught him how to run the box, right? Is that. Uh, I taught him how to run the bazooka. Right. Which right, I, right. which I totally forgot about cause I've taught so many people, but uh, he yeah. refreshed my memory. I was like, yeah, I remember that you had that shitty Ames taper that was like, <laughs> it like wouldn't slide. And I think it like cut us or something when we were trying to use it, it was all messed up. And I grabbed mine and was like, man, this thing runs super smooth. And like, this is how it should run. And yeah. Yeah. That was, uh, that was years ago. That was probably like 2012. Yeah. And he was, he uh, he's a he rock star off. now, dude. Yeah. He is. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. Was, uh, <laughs> he was subbing off me back then. And actually he was the first one I ever seen. He had a Graco sprayer mm-hmm. and he was spraying his skin coat on. Oh yeah. And then just trowel it off. I was like, wow, that's that's pretty awesome, man. That's that's some cool shit. Uh Corey does that down in um Nebraska. Like Corey owns uh Tech Dry. Oh yeah, Tech Dry. And uh yeah, yeah. and that, and that's you know, he implements that sprayer. And I mean, I thought it was nuts the first time he told me about it. And then when you see it in action, you're like, that's pretty slick. If you could like spray a butt joint and then skin yeah. blade, like man, you could you could skim some butt joints out really fast. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's wild. Um, so in the beginning, you're on the tools and stuff, and then does it just click? Like, I'm going to swap over to building a business, or was that always kind of the plan? Uh, that was always that was always the plan yeah. from, like, very young age. Like, I got started in drywall when I was 13. Oh, yeah. That's a summer job. 
And then I was full time by 16. I used to like take the bus to high school. I get off the bus and be like, yeah, I'm not really feeling it today. And I would just like hitchhike to the next town where my boss was and show up. And he's like, what the hell are you doing here? I'm like, eh, I was either getting in trouble at school and, or come here and make some money. So I figured I'd come here. And then I just kept doing that. I was at work more than I was at school. And, you know, one mm-hmm. thing led to another. And I just uh, started working full time. I actually, I moved out at 16 too. So I ended up full time drywaller and on my own at uh at 16 that's wild sink or swim man i literally <laughs> i mean i wish when i left school i had found construction I, yeah. I would be in a very different place not that i would be in a different place but like i would have got a hell of a head start like mm-hmm. I, I think i started realistically being focused on it in my 20s mm-hmm. where if i would have got another 10 years out of that it would have been bomb um i did a bunch of sales and like all that that's kind of good. stuff. That's, that, that's good though, man. That all oh, yeah. ties it, into it, right? It did me a great service for sure. Yeah. Um, and I always, like I was doing commission work, which in my opinion is the sales version of like uh, footage. Yeah. Where, where like, yeah, you can make as much as you want. It, yeah. it has to do with how much effort you're going to put into it. And yeah. so I think the crossover, it was like, oh, I've done this before. I know exactly yeah. what this is. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. That's cool, man. Wow, 13. So yeah, by by 15, like I knew I wanted to own a drywall company, Mm -hmm. a big one, and have lots of sites, lots of crews, lots of guys, trucks, all that. Like I I had that vision then. And that was my my vehicle, you know, to uh like just be who I wanted to be, you know. I just knew that that was it. Like home life wasn't great. So Mm -hmm. I knew I had to do something. Uh I wasn't going to university and stuff like school wasn't going well. So I had to find a vehicle to get me to where I wanted to be. And that was it. And I just grabbed onto that and, uh, and went. That's still, I'm, I'm glad I did. Cause like, it's, well, it's obviously turned out well. Um, yeah, I love it. One of you, one of the things in your stories today was the eight steps. You want to talk about that? I think that was pretty neat. The eight steps. Yeah. What was it again? Let me pull it up. All right. <laughs> I know, I know what it was. I know what it was. I just want to have it in front of me. Yeah. Okay. Eight steps to running a kick-ass business, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, cause it's stuff like that. Like, um, they always stick with you when you've got like a, a set amount of, you know, this, this, this go down the line. Uh, Arnold always had those, like the five steps to success or whatever. Um, yeah. yeah. and it, like, they've stayed like my laptop sits on top of the Schwarzenegger's encyclopedia of bodybuilding. It's just the right nice. height. <laughs> it's the right <laughs> yeah. height off the table, but it's yeah. like, always look at it and it's like, it's a good reminder. Yeah. I, yeah. So you gotta... the, uh, the eight steps. Um, yeah, like this came to me last night, you know, and this is kind of a big portion of my program too. It's kind of like part of the, part of the layout. Um, like create a vision and goals. Yeah. A lot of us don't know where we want to end up, right? We're just like out here working, you know, and we want to grow, but we have no idea how. And a lot of people just think getting more leads is how you grow. But what do you do with all those leads? Yeah. You know, you got to have a a foundation. So that's why number two, build a foundation, right? Yeah. The, the, um, having a vision is one of those things that is not taught. Mm-hmm. properly it's yes. like and, and like setting a five-year goal people go like oh, i don't know what i'm going to do next month and i'm just trying to keep my head above water and all this stuff and it's like yeah mm-hmm. but it would be easier if you had a goal yes. um and and it doesn't have to be an unattainable goal your big goal should be stupid it should be yeah. something that you don't think you'll ever get and then you got to break it down to like smaller very manageable you know get up put your pants on like that kind of stuff that you can do yeah. every day um you know, one of those things that, that Arnold said, cause his was the same thing, have a clear vision. Mm-hmm. And he says, uh, you know, you can have the fastest ship in the world, but if you don't have a destination, it's not going to get anywhere. Yes. Um, so I'm going to pick your brain after every step. I think this will be fun. Yeah. So like the, the whole vision thing, I've always had a vision. Like yeah. I had that vision at 15 and then I got together with my wife, uh, when I was like 19, 20, somewhere around there. Um, and we had a vision from day one and we wrote mm-hmm. down our goals of where we wanted to be, you know, like the house, the cars, everything, the kids, when we were going to have them, what age we were going to have them, what our whole life kind of looked like, how we were going to retire. And we had it all planned out. And I thought that it would take me till I was 70 Mm -hmm. to achieve it all. 
dude, I'm already there a few years ago. Yeah. <laughs> it only took me half the time that I thought it would. It's crazy how streamlined it becomes when yeah. you're like, oh, these hurdles are not as high as I thought they were. I could pick up yeah. the pace a little bit. And it, especially if you got the right partner behind you, man, and like you have, you share the same yeah. path, if you will. Yeah. Um, you know, on the bad days, you're both there for each other. On the good days, yes. you're both celebrating together. Like it's, yeah, yeah. good for you. That's, that's solid. The, uh, that's the cheat code, man. You're like mm -hmm. manifesting that life together, right? So two heads are, are stronger than one for sure. Totally. Yeah. So once you get that vision, right, you create that vision. Okay. How do I get there? Well, like you need to build it on a sturdy foundation. Mm -hmm. So like you got to have a foundation for your business, just like you have to have a foundation for your life. You know, if you're living out in the street and just like kicking a hacky sack around every day, not like taking steps towards your uh, vision, you don't, you don't have a very good foundation. You don't mm -hmm. have a place to lay your head at night. Right. So it's the same thing with your business, like having that solid foundation and some processes of how you operate. Um, like I always say, like, have a good accountant and bookkeeper. So yeah. many guys don't do any of that shit. When I first started, I started my business. I went down to, I think it was city hall or the courthouse or something that you had to go to. And I, I registered the business and then I worked for like three years. I just yeah. got checks, <laughs> cashed them. I had money. And then all of a sudden the tax man caught up to me and is like, Hey, you owe all this money. I'm like, for what? Yeah. And then you have to go down that road and figure all that out. And by then, like you're in it, you know, and you're in it kind of deep and it's a lot to figure out on your own. And then you try and just go to an accountant and they don't really help you that much. Most no. of them, you know, like they're like, just bring your bag of receipts and I'll file your taxes for you. And like, they don't really tell you the whole process of what's going on and what you're responsible for. They just expect you to know. And most drywall guys like myself don't, I knew how to do drywall. Yeah. I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to run a business. So that's part of that, uh, that foundation, right. Is like having, having those steps in place. One of the, I would say most successful, and I don't mean financially, but like actually running the business that I, that I met along the way when I, I was quite young still. And so was he to be, to be fair, but he had a accountant, a real accountant that would do a monthly check-in with him and go, you know, mm -hmm. I think it's time to pick up some more tools. Like, I, mm -hmm. I think maybe you should take it easy next month. I think this, mm -hmm. I think that. And it's just that little bump in the right direction, right? Like, it's like your mechanic telling you what you should be doing with your car. It's yeah. you, you don't know, you're not a mechanic. Yeah. You know, you, you need to have a professional in place that is going to kind of lead you in the right direction with things that you're not a hundred percent on. Like you said, we can do drywall hundred percent. Yeah. Um, but are you an accountant? No. No, uh, no. and it, it probably seems expensive to anybody listening, but on the back end, it's really not, um, not yeah, when you're doing things correctly, you're, you're going to dodge bullets and, and you're, there'll be no surprises, which is huge. Yeah. Like you said, the tax man comes, it's, uh, either way you're paying them, whether it's <laughs> hiring an accountant now and helping you with that, or like figuring it out later when it's a big pile of shit, like yeah. you're, you're dealing with it eventually. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That foundation is pretty solid. I think yeah. even personally, um, you know, you want to have a successful business, but you suck as a person. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard because yeah. there's a lot of back and forth. Like you, you can be the best uh, finisher in the world, mm -hmm. uh, but it, but if nobody wants to work with you because you're terrible or you can't show up on time or like a number of different things, you need to have yeah. that foundation as a person as well. And I've I think that's lots of good guys that are mm -hmm. like that. <laughs> Lots of good Whoa. tapers. <laughs> yeah. yeah, man. Yeah. And it, 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 you know, and even at that, like you're saying, like you, if you're hesitating to call one of the best tapers, you know, there's a real problem there. Yeah. 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 I've, I've got, you know, lots of my phone where it's like, man, this guy can pound up work, but he has a nightmare to deal with. I got a guy that does T-bar and I have never seen a guy throw up T-bar so fast. He can do four or five classrooms a day by himself. Ooh. But to have him on site is like the worst experience you have ever had in your life, man. He's yelling and screaming and angry. If somebody's in his way, he's throwing them out of the way, like just old school, crazy. Like we, we can't have him around. And it's we, too bad because he's like a weapon when it comes to uh, putting up T-bar. We had an old Croatian guy when I was in the very beginning, I was working out of town. We were doing Monday to the following Friday. We do 12s. And then when, when we got overtime, like you were doing more than 12s and they would bring this guy in. And just like you said, he was an absolute weapon, but there could be nobody around. 
Yeah. Like he he found uh, one of the site super's assistants and he he was calling the guy Charlie Brown because that's what he reminded him of. And he was like bullying and harassing the site super's assistant. And like uh, <laughs> they, they they did the Conestoga Mall. This was after the fact. And like security had him like both legs and both arms had to carry him outside of the mall. And it just they never Jeez. used him again. But yeah. he was one of the best guys I had ever seen at the time because he was hand taping um but it was incredible but it, just like you said like that is like shooting yourself in the foot yeah it's crazy yeah, yeah. so yeah you got to have that like you said the personal foundation the business foundation have the account have the bookkeeper and then like just like small things like invoicing how are you mm -hmm. invoicing you know right. like do you remember the like little carbon copy receipt pads and you like yes. write that out and then you lose it by accident or you like spill coffee on it or whatever like there's still guys doing that it's crazy like it's nuts and then you're expecting you know clients to respect you as a business owner when yeah. you're handing in this uh this invoice it's got like coffee spill on and stuff like yeah. we're we're in the new age you know so that's part of that foundation like the accounting the bookkeeping your invoicing process like how is all that set up before you start getting more leads make sure you can actually handle those leads right and your business has a has a foundation yeah facilitate it yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. what's what's step three? Uh, establish your pricing. Yes, and this is that, huge right that's now. That's not just pricing with like um, you know what your subs are charging you or what hourly rates are. That's like what's your markup and margin? And yes. most guys do not know what markup and margin is. You probably do because you're a sales guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, drywall guys don't know that. It took yep. me seven years in business to figure out what markup and margin was. Well, a lot of guys, even as a sole proprietor, right? You're making money on your labor for sure because it's your labor. Yeah. But but your business isn't. Isn't. So how yeah. do you ever switch that from being the guy in the tools to the guy in the business? And that's what I struggled with. And that's what most yeah. people struggle with, right? They don't charge enough to make that switch. If they were yeah. to hire somebody to replace them, there's no money left over. Yeah. And it's a, we kind of talked about pricing a little bit before we started. And it is one of the silliest things that people want to discuss with you, where it's just like, what do you charge per foot? And it's like, that is the most vast, ridiculous question that yeah. somebody can ask you point blank. Yeah. Cause it's like, is there high stuff? Is it, what's the finish? You know, yeah. what materials are you using? What detail work is there? Like, mm -hmm. it, like what's your lineage pricing? Like, and uh, linear pricing, I should say. And, 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 they'll just stare at you and it's like, okay, then what are you like? You don't have the basics yet. No, so why no. are you asking somebody that's running a massive business, what they're charging? Like you're just not yeah. there. Yeah. Um, but then and then there's uh, guys that will just a buck a foot, you know, yeah. that's, that's their price. It doesn't matter if it's easy, if it's hard, it's a buck a foot and they do really good sometimes and they do really bad sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and on the sites that you lose your ass, that was your fault. Oh yeah. And, and typically those are the guys sitting around on site grumbling about the fact that they're not being paid enough, but it's like, yeah. you came up with this number. Yeah. This is your fault. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you, you agree to it. Maybe it is the builder, maybe the builder's cheap or whatever, but like totally. you have the power to change your reality. Like I tell people all the time, you don't have to be the same person you were five minutes ago. No, you can completely change yourself in five minutes. Same as your business. You do not have to be the same business tomorrow as you were yesterday. Right. Like you can have zero jobs today and be a piece of shit. Next week, you can have 10 jobs and be an awesome person. Totally. It's all the choice. Yeah. And I do kind of get that dollar a foot thing. Like if you don't want to break it down, you don't have to, but like, if you take a look at it and say, you know, whatever, maybe it was, would have been 80 cents or something like that. And then you've got a little bit of extra this and that. And, mm -hmm. and in the long run, it's kind of the same thing because you understand the scope, you understand how yeah. much time it's going to take. But like, I don't even think that's a discussion with a, with a lot of these people in their heads. I think it's just, you know, I've heard these three numbers and these are the ones that I say to get the jobs, but it, you know, at the end of the day, either you're going to smash your pocketbook or the quality of the job, and both are unacceptable. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. You have to know what's going on with your with your pricing and know that markup and margin because that is that is huge. That that completely changed the trajectory of my business. Like yeah. I was in residential for so long, I figured out what markup and margin was and was like, wow, I can't make money here like I thought. I need <laughs> to switch, and that's why I switched to commercial because. 
then I was competing against companies, right? Whereas like in residential, it's hard because a lot of times you're competing against a guy and he's got a few employees, right? And he can do it much cheaper than you. And you can't touch that. You switch to commercial. The jobs are a lot bigger. The payments are stretched out a lot further. So not, you know, not many average guys can do that. So the people in that world understand making a profit for the business and not being on the tools every day. So it's a, just a totally different, uh, totally different market. It, it, it is a different animal. So I ran major sites for a while. Um, like I, I became a foreman and then I became a, you know, like a basically running outside of the office trailer. And then I started running sites as a site super. I, I started getting into project management and I hated it because it's mm -hmm. like, you, you can do the best that you can do. And it is someone else's problem. That is mm -hmm. your problem all the time. And, and yeah. I was, I was just so done with that, but, um, seeing that difference and, and starting to understand what 90 days means. Like mm -hmm. if you, if you can't figure out your gas this week, there's no way that you can wait 90 days for a payment. Exactly. Um, and then, you know, you're going to have deficiencies and you're going to have all those types of things, but yeah. yeah, commercial really is where it's at. I mean, if you're scaling, yeah. Um, because if you, you know, like we had Walmart, and uh lows when they were coming in uh mm -hmm. it was under manicore at the time and they were great but when you get into contracts like that they've got a hundred sites across canada yeah so if yeah. you're laying if you're landing sites now it's just a matter of okay so what does it cost to get everyone there what does it cost to keep them there mm -hmm. bid it yeah 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 and like you can make lots of money in residential i'm not saying you can't but as a totally scalable thing for me it just didn't make sense anymore and i scaled it up right like i had uh 30 40 guys i was doing wow. three sites 100 houses a year just the money just wasn't there and then when mm -hmm. i raised my prices we just had a disagreement with the builder he didn't like it and it just made more sense to head a head a different direction so I always found that the, like the major, like quote unquote, major contracts for residential are these like slap it up and run like townhouse yeah. facilities and like high yeah. rise and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, maybe the money's there, but is that what you want your business to be is mm -hmm. like a, you know, taillights. Yeah. 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 You know, and, and for some people that works really well, but yeah. if you want to have a business that's based on quality, it's, it, you have yeah. to be providing quality. And that was the problem that I had too, was like working for a builder like that. I'm trying to do the best job possible, but everybody before me is garbage and everybody after me is garbage, right? Like yeah. these houses are like three inches at a square. Sometimes you get three days to board and tape a house, which is nuts. Yeah. Can't right? do it. Like, yeah. yeah. So how do you keep that level of quality and keep, how do you sleep at night? You know, that's, that's yeah. how I felt. It was so hard to do a good job and, uh, and stick with that. So so this is the first time that I'm seeing somebody else get those emojis pop up on the screen. And I, I that's what happened with Nick. He says, if I put my thumb up thing. man, then it just yeah. pops up. Yeah. I, I don't, it must be a setting that I have set or something. Well, me too. When I started paying for it this year, like I, when I was on the podcast with Teak and my hands were like this and it thought that that was a thumbs up and it, it like, it, it's distracting a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, but whatever I kind of, it's, you know, it's a, it's kind of fun, like, I guess. Is, is, is there a middle finger emoji? Like, does that work? I mean, I try not to give the guests <laughs> the middle finger. But <laughs> maybe, maybe there is, man. Maybe, um, maybe it'll happen one day. Yeah, pricing is super important, though. I mean, uh, yeah. so I did uh, like a shadow bead reveal around a bunch of doors in a high-end house a little while ago. I do like a lot of mercenary work where it's just like, hey, we, we need you to do this. Like we, we've got all the rest of it done, but like, we need you to do this or come in and tape out a house or like whatever it is. And I'm super happy to do that at a day rate. That's, you know, pretty high. Um, but then I made a video of doing it. There was a inch and a half casing and then the reveal bead and then the board and the casing wasn't there yet. Yeah. So you got to set up two lasers, you got to hit yeah. your vertical and like it, and it's time. It takes a lot of time. And people yeah. are like, why are you taking so much time doing that? That seems overkill and it's like because that's what i charged to do like yeah. it it's this this is overkill right this is the best job possible that can be done and mm -hmm. and you but you have to charge for that too because you're going to knock it out of the park and that's great for content or whatever you want to say but if you're losing money doing good work 
that's the end of you, man. You're not going to make yeah. that three year mark. Like I, I talked to guys that have been in the business a long time and they say three years. That's typically that fall off point where it's like, you just have not made enough money. You can't mm -hmm. sustain your life. Um, that's when, that's when the government catches up with you. Totally. Start that, that three year mark. Right. And then they start calling and they're like, you owe this money. We did a notice of assessment. You owe us $53,000. And they're like 53,000. Like how the hell do I come up with that? So yeah. Yeah. We, that's, you know, what I like to help with is helping people not get in that situation to begin with or giving them some avenues to get out of that. Cause right. I, like I said, I've, I've been there myself. Right. Yeah. So Quite that's, uh, that's the pricing. So number four, simplify yeah. the estimating. Okay. A lot of us like reinvent the wheel every yes. time we write something, right? We don't have a system in place. We don't like create a template. We don't have some like set rates of like, this is what we charge for corner beat. This is what we charge for drywall, right? So every time we're reinventing the wheel, we're like writing it on smoke packs or notepads or whatever. It's not saved anywhere. And then you get into the job and you're like, shit, what did I charge for that? And what did I do there? And I help well, simplify that whole, that whole process. Cause I've been, I've literally been estimating for like almost 20 years. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. I mean, and, and building a relationship with people, uh, you know, as, as customers and things being different all the time, like they, they already know what you're going to charge. If you've worked for them a half a dozen times, that's why they're yeah. calling you because yeah. they know you're really good at these specific things. They know what it costs roughly. And, and that's the way that it is. And when you're coming in at different stuff all the time, you're, it's, you're just creating headaches for people that are yeah. trying to alleviate headaches. Yes. And, um, you know, like I'm a big fan of line items and I'll put zeros be beside them, specialty bead, yeah. fresco harmony, you know, yeah. uh, you know, whatever level, yeah. level two, three, four, five, whatever you need. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, are you going to put a uh, resilient channel up? Like it, uh, some people see that stuff and they're like, what is that? Yeah. And then that leads you into being able to upsell on certain things as well. Right. Like, um, telling people about specialty bead from trim text, they don't even know it's a thing. Yeah. And it's like, you're doing yourself a disservice doing that. Yeah. Um, but you're right. Yeah. Organizing that and then having it in like a spreadsheet or yeah. something. Some templates. That's like completely part of my program, man. Everything yeah. is cool there. I have the templates. It's plug and play, punch in your own numbers, very simple process. All the trainings of how I estimate the software that I use, like how I go through a set of drawings and do it from the drawings and like <laughs> upload that into a software. It's like, crazy once you can get to that level of estimating and like you don't even have to drive to the house to price it because most of us when we're first starting out that's what we do right like we go there and mm -hmm. we do the board count yeah and if somebody was to send you a set of drawings and say hey i'm building a house next spring can you give me a price on this most guys can't do that no whereas like some of the jobs i price they don't start for two years yeah okay right so i'm pricing big jobs and you know they might break ground next spring by the time it's ready for me, it's the following spring, the following fall, something like that, right? Yeah. So we have to be able to price that from the drawing, hold that price, and uh, you know, give numbers that general contractors and uh, developers can can rely on. So to be able to do that is is huge. So do you ever come into any sort of a headache where it's like you priced it now, and in two years from now things are vastly different, and it's like. It never used to be like that. Yeah, that's why I'm asking. Yeah. Since COVID, insane. I was getting plumbing quotes that were good for 72 hours during yes. during COVID. Because they're like, yeah. we don't even know what the stuff we're using is going to cost next yeah. week. So yeah. we just can't. Yeah, it was, um, it was wild. Steel stud yeah. went insane. And actually, the steel stud started in, I think, 2018 when... Mm -hmm. uh, Trump put that tariff on all the imports. Yeah. And then like all of a sudden steel stud shot through the roof because it was being imported. Right. So the prices just like went up overnight. So then we went from there in the COVID when everything shot up too. And the price, like it's, it's double what it used to be to right. buy a three and five, eight stud. Now it's double per linear foot than from what I remember it was crazy. Which is nuts and it was everything right it was drywall insulation ceiling tiles every product that we use was so volatile and nobody would hold a price like 
before COVID, I used to call up the supplier. I'd, I'd send them my, my list of materials for the job. And be like, hey, I've got this job coming up. Can you give me some special pricing and hold it for this job? Yeah, yeah, no problem. Send me an email. Here's your pricing. We'll hold it till this date. Now, there, there's no hold. Like, right. this is the price today. We don't know what it is tomorrow. And that Which is definitely difficult. I mean, as a supplier, I under, I would understand that way back when maybe it went up or down a little bit, but you've got a relationship yeah. and it's like, we're going to hold to what we said, but yeah, if it doubles or it goes up yeah. 30%, it's a little hard. Yeah. Yeah. It's not. So now we're stuck in the middle because the supplier won't hold it, but the GC wants us to hold it. Yeah. So then we end up holding the bag and trying to navigate these new waters that we still haven't fully figured out what to do. Now we try to carry some material increases but then also you price yourself too high sometimes because the other guy didn't. That was going to be the right. next thing I brought up is yeah. like for you to take care of yourself and protect yourself as a business owner, you know, you have to price high. You have to, you know, kind of see the storm coming mm -hmm. and you know when it doesn't sure. Like it, that's an absolute win, but when it does, you're not eating ramen. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's a, it's a fine line. That's for sure. Yeah. No kidding. It's a fine line very interesting this is fun yeah okay yeah. what's the, yeah. what's the, what's the uh, next one so now that we've like this is literally my program so now that we've done all that like you know created your vision built the foundation figured out your pricing simplify your estimate now it's time to crank up the lead generation you've right. got the foundation to handle more leads now so that's when we finally jump in the leads and everybody wants leads first but you got to have that foundation first right mm -hmm. so now we crank up the lead generation i've got like a ton of different strategies that i use for lead gen I think what it boils down to the biggest thing with getting jobs is the follow-up, right? It's the follow-up and creating the relationships, right? Like if you just throw a price at somebody, your price might even be the lowest, mm -hmm. but you don't get the job because they have a relationship with somebody else. And I, I think relationships are huge, huge in the industry. That's one of the biggest things that helped me having a sales background. Mm -hmm. was it, somebody was going to give you leads to sell someone something and every single one of them was a bag of money and yeah. you're either not going to go get that money or you're or you are yeah and and you have to be prepared and you have to be ready and and all of those things you have to have your shit together if you will mm -hmm. and um building relationships with people made the difference almost every time yeah. Where it's like, this was an absolute pleasure working with this person because they knew what mm -hmm. they were talking about. They didn't try to send me off to something I didn't want or need. Yeah. Um, now, you know, what, what we used to call attach back at the back in the day, right, where you would provide what they needed. And then it was up to you to, to upsell, like, or like I'm saying, specialty bead fresco, like all these different yeah. types of things. Are you sure you don't want a level four? Because yeah. you do. Yeah. Uh, and then what's the price difference between that? And it, and yeah. realistically, it's not huge. It's one more no. day. Yeah. And as the, um, drywall finisher, I mean, that cuts down sand day, huge people that are doing two coats. If you take a look at what your sanding day is after two coats, as opposed to three coats, yeah. it, 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 you're doing yourself a big favor and That's... they're going to, they're going to pay you extra for that. Yeah. I used, um, to, I, used to, I used to do two coats all the time and oh, totally. then you up, you got to light everything out yeah. and sponge everything out, find all the touch ups. Whereas if you do that third coat, that sand is mm -hmm. so much nicer, <laughs> so much nicer. Yeah. I'd like, I lamp out all the flats and butts, but it's very rare that I ever mm -hmm. touch them again. Yeah. But you know, you go over it quick, like you do yeah. your job, do your job. Yeah. But if you, if you do the two coats, you're going over it. You got to find all those little fish eyes, hundred scratches, like there's lots of shit going on, but me coming from a production background, I had like three days to tape the house most times. Three yeah. days, you know, it's not, it's not a lot of time. So no, you have to, you know, skimp a little bit. Not that you want to, but that's what the builder is paying for, right? But then when you get into the custom homes, it's it's much different. It's like we used to do, uh, like if it's custom home, we did two coats on the three ways. Yes. Okay. They sanded out so nice. Like you'd run the corner, you tie them in when you taped. Yes. Then you'd run the corners and tie them in. Then just tie them in again, just for fun and go yep. the other way. And they stand up so nice when, as you're doing production, they only get done once. And that's wow. after you run, that's after you run the angles, they get, they get one coat and then, uh, well, they get as you tape too, but, uh, yeah. once you run them, tie them in again, 
and then that's it. And then just touch them up. That's typically my process. I'll, I'll go in with a knife, pick it, uh, flatten it all out. Like, but when I'm taping, there's nothing on the wall. You wipe it all mm -hmm. out clean yeah. and then, and then you pick it out, make sure everything's set properly and then coat it the first time. And then when you come back that second time, same thing with your knife, you pick it all out, then you yeah. sand it, then you coat it. Yeah. You know, and then when you run your finish angles, it's, it's just glass anyways, but you're yeah. going to go over it again because it takes 10 seconds and you're going to clean it out anyways. Yeah. Um, you know, doing, doing two full coats. I, I mean, I think a lot of people get away with stuff because it's just the way that it is and, and it's fast, but the end product sucks. And well, then and I, and, it all comes down to the sand and the light out too, right? Like you can do as many coats as you want. If you don't actually turn on a light yeah. and grab a sponge, you can still leave a shit job. Like yeah. it needs that finesse, right? It needs that. And it's much easier to give that finesse when you do the right amount of coats, but you can also do a really nice job with only a couple coats if you go over it properly. Right. But a lot and, of guys don't go over it properly. <laughs> and, and, and that goes back to having a system. Of, yeah. you know, do you, do you have a process that you follow? Um, you know, I go back to Steve, he has a process, uh, and, and it, and it works. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, I, I, I probably helped him with a lot of that process. <laughs> yeah, probably, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause I had a process. I had a system for taping, man. I was like a factory. It didn't matter how many guys I had, I could split it up and still do the same. Like I've seen some guys and they'll go in and they like do everything in a room. They'll like run the angles, run the box, spot the screws, and they complete the room before they leave. Whereas I'm like totally different. I no. walk into a house, I sand everything. I then run all the angles. Then I run all the flats. Like I complete that whole system. And as I add more guys, I just split that task up, yeah. right? You run all the flats, I'll run the angles. Or, hey, we've got two angle boxes. Let's both run the angles. Then we'll both run the flats. But like you're not doing all this cross contamination shit and leaving stuff. One of the biggest problems I think I've ever seen with tapers is moving to the next stage before they've done the last one. So like yes. they'll come in and tape and they won't get all the tapes on. Then they come in the next day and they start running the box. Yeah. But it's like, you didn't finish taping. And then all of a sudden they tell me, Hey, I'm going to be done tomorrow. I'm like you're gonna be done tomorrow. Like you got the flat skin, but you got shit. That's not taped. Like yeah. you're not done tomorrow, man. There's no way you're done tomorrow. So yeah. Having that process and following it is like essential and it's essential in your business too, not just on the job site. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a good one for everybody because and anyways, we'll get into that when we're done. What's the next one? Yeah. I get, I'll, I'm trying my best not to be okay. sidetracked. Sorry. I had it here. Uh, after lead gen. Yeah. Syst systematize the operations. Okay. Right. Having like, just what we were talking about, have systems, you know, once you figure out a system for how you do the work, you gotta have a system for your business too. And that's where a lot of guys fall off. They're so good at the work. They don't mm -hmm. think about the business stuff and they have no system for that. But like, you know, they know how to tape, they know how to hang, like they have those systems down. So all you have to do is create that in your business and then follow those and then pass that off to somebody else so they can follow it. Yeah. Everything is just systems. And like I started systems, I guess, when I started taping, you know, and then it went on to systematizing my residential stuff, which like I had down to a science and ran a hundred houses a year with like checklists. Yeah. And, you know, I was just talking with uh, Nick this morning about this, about um, I used to have uh, borders, berry plugs and switches and lights and shit yeah. all the time. And I get the call and the place is painted. The electrician's in there doing the plug and switch. So like, they call me like, Hey, you're missing nine plugs, two bathroom fans and add a catch and four lights. And I'm like, Holy shit, man. I'm like, yeah, come on guys. Insane. And then I dealt with that like multiple times over and over again. And I got really good at finding box. I could like rub the wall and feel yep. the bump and try and find it. But then if you strap the ceilings with resilient channel and the box wasn't set down, there's yeah, no you're bump. Never going to find it. <laughs> yeah. So I get this idea. I'm like, why don't I just mark all the plugs and switches with spray paint? Mm -hmm. before the, the board's delivered so yeah. that's what i started doing and then it was part of our process that after the borders were done we go into the checklist and make sure they've done everything we wanted and they've got you know the scrap in the right place and use the right screws and blah 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 and we would line up all the spray paint and make sure there was something above it if there was no box where there was spray paint hey you guys missed the box and yeah. then we would get it caught then 
before the taper even got there, long before it was ever painted and everything else. So it's all just systems. Yeah. Yeah. And when you look at it like that, it's, it's their cheat codes, man. Like once you, once you've got them figured out, it's, this is not going to change. This is the thing that makes it profitable. And you know, the first time that you, that you, like you said, you use a system and you make a bag of money on a site, you're not going to not do that again. No, it's, it's just a matter of wrapping your head around it. Like you're saying, spray painting the floors. Brilliant. Yeah. You know, use a color for things that are at four feet, use a color for yeah. things that are at 18 inches or 16 inches. Yeah. And then, I see. yeah, I've got a little system. If it's a, if it's a normal height box, it's a line. If it's one up high, it's a line with a circle. Perfect. Like super simple little process. Right. So that's what my program's about is sharing all that stuff with everybody, all my templates and stuff that I use and my checklists that I use, I give all that to everybody and show them how to implement those those processes in their business so they can get back to doing, you know, sales, marketing. And like, if they want to be on the tools of it, be on the tools, like wherever you want to grow your business, you can use the systems that I have to stay small and really zone in on things and simplify things. Or you just take those and scale them because Mm -hmm. you just keep doubling it. Right. And it's the same system. You just add more people to these systems. Right. So super simple process. I like it. Yeah. Okay, that was systematize the operations. Next is uh, autopilot, the hiring process. Yes, this is exciting. Hiring is a a big thing for me. I always thought that my struggle with growing was hiring. And I think most people feel that way. It's either leads or hiring, right? Yeah. With the hiring though, um, do you have a company that people want to work for? Yes. Most people don't. Like if if you were to sit and think like, hey, if I had to support my wife and kids. Would I trust that to this guy? Mm. Right. That's why a lot of guys go to the union and they go to the big companies. Everything's laid out. Like you join the union, there's a handbook. Everything's laid out in there. What you get, what your, your pay rate is, what your holidays are, you know, down to dress code, like everything's in there of what you're supposed to do and what you get in return. Most struggle guys don't have that. No, they just expect guys to know. And then guys come and ask them a question and everything's got to run through the owner. And then you're bogged down with answering questions and you get frustrated and you hire shitty guys. Well, you're getting the shitty guys because for one, you're not looking in the right spots for them. And two, like, why would they want to work for you? There's no good guys out there that want to work for you. Right. Well, and I mean, that's a, you hit it right on the head of bogging down the guy that's running everything. Uh, I don't want to pay a guy X amount of dollars. That's a lot of money. Okay. Mm -hmm. But when every other day he's spending an hour of your time, what's an hour of your time worth? And then how many of those guys are you going to have around? Or you pay somebody that is smart, that Mm -hmm. knows how to run a business and knows how to do his job properly. And then every once in a while you have a call or or a a checkup, or maybe there is an issue, but it happens once. Mm -hmm. And, And those types of people, they figure it out. Um, yeah, man. I mean, I think there is such an issue with quality people, uh, Mm -hmm. because people are looking at who, what is the cheapest option for getting, getting guys on site and then we'll figure it out later, but figuring it out later costs money. Big time. Yeah. Big time. And then you you hire a bunch of guys, they're all crap. You get rid of them. Like, I don't want to be big anymore. Yeah. And I used, I used to do the same thing and you hire friends and family and like dads on Kijiji and like. No, like none, none of that works, man. Like there are lots of good guys out there. They're just working for other people. Right. And they're not happy typically. They're not. And that's the thing. And we like crack the code on that, how to get your job offer in front of those good guys. Mm -hmm. Right. Like you could just drive up to the job, your competitors, job sites and try and steal them, (laughs) but that's not very ethical. No. So the strategy we use is to run paid ads and get our ad in front of them. Right. So that they're sitting on their lunch break and they're scrolling on their phone and they see your ad and they don't do anything the first day. They don't do anything the second day, but then all of a sudden, like they're short on footage because we use this for hiring subs too. They're short on footage or they're short on hours again. And they're like, ah, fuck this company. And like, boom, they click apply now on your, on your ad. Once they do that, you're only through part of the battle, right? Because now you've got them in your ecosystem, but you need to prove to these good guys, your company that they want to work for. Right. And if you've got some sloppy process and you're like answering the phone, yelling and screaming on the phone because you're on site and like you don't take the time to nurture them, 
They're not yep. going to want to work for you. So what we've done is automated the process. And like when people come in, it's the same process every time. We have the same hiring process, the same onboarding process. We present to them that we're a professional company. Everything's laid out, company manual, when they get paid, same as subs. Like you invoice on Thursday, you get paid the following Friday. If you invoice on the Friday, it gets bumped. Like Yeah, because that's how it works here. Yes, whereas like a lot of guys don't do that, right? They're like, there is no set invoice date. It's just like invoice me when I have the money, I'll pay you kind of deal. Maybe yeah. it'll be quick. Maybe it won't. It depends how it goes, right? So you got to have that company that people want to work for. And once I realized that, that's what really fueled my growth because I always had um, a fairly easy time getting bigger jobs just because I've been doing it for so long. And I had to turn a lot of stuff down because I could only yeah. handle so much. So once I figured out that hiring thing, I could take on more work and that's right. paid tenfold. Yeah. I got a lot to say. We'll get through this. <laughs> What's the next one after hiring? Uh, what was, was that it? I think that's seven. No, it might not be. Dude, I put eight steps and I only did seven. Okay. And the eighth step is to come on my podcast and talk about eight it. steps. Come on. I, I think the eighth step is just supposed to be like rinse and repeat. And yeah. That makes sense. If you want to. I was supposed to put rinse and repeat. So there is more steps, obviously. <laughs> That yeah, I go yeah, yeah. through and building a business, but I just like threw those steps together last night that kind of came to me. It's kind of, and the I mean, the program and... that's brilliant. Yeah. Especially when you have a program like yours. So anytime I see something like that in the back of my head, it's like, here's another guy that's just trying to make, uh, you know, X amount of dollars off people that can't afford it. And what does yeah. it really bring to the table and all this other kind of crap. Yeah. But what you're talking about, is a little different than that. It's yeah. like, Hey man, are you lost? Do you yeah. know what's going on here actually? Or are you just doing your best? Cause like yeah. we, we can facilitate that. And I, and I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, because there definitely are these like mentor coaches, like life coaches out there. Lots, you know Lots. what I mean? I've it, been down those roads and that's why totally. I'm doing what I'm doing. Yeah. And I mean, um, handing over templates is huge. Yeah. You know, handing over like how to automate things is huge. Mm -hmm. And like you said, you don't have to have a $6 million business. You could just run your business better and not have 100%. as many headaches, maybe get 100%. some better guys, maybe get some yeah. better clients. Yeah. And, and yeah, and that all, that all makes sense, man. That's another is. stupid question that we were talking about before is people like they, they don't want to sit and listen to the whole thing. They just want to know how much it is so they can say no and then move yeah. on. And it's like, well, yeah. this isn't going to work for you because you got to listen. Yeah. And you got to put in the work, right? That, and that's like, a huge thing these days. You got to put in the work because, you know, everybody just wants a quick fix. There is no quick fix to fixing your business and like making it run. You know, a lot of guys will go and spend money on auto tools. I yeah. think that's going to fix the business because then they can go faster and they can make more money, but they don't see it. They're like looking at the smoke over here and not the fire over here, right? Like the fire yeah. is in those business operations and simplifying all that shit, but they just say, produce more work, do more work, be faster, and that'll mm -hmm. solve everything. And it, yeah. it doesn't, they just burn themselves out, right? Yeah, man. And I mean, I, I was hand taping. Uh, I'm a carpenter by trade, yeah. so I, I, I can build a house. Um, but I always fell back on drywall because it was easy money, uh, for me anyways. And then eventually people know that you can tape and then they're calling you in to tape other people's stuff. And then like, unless you're really good at hand taping, that's a nightmare. Yeah. And I gave up, man. I was like, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going to push into carpentry. I'm going to push into running teams and sites and all those types of things. And then when the auto tools came out, I was like, that is fun. And, yeah. and that makes a lot more sense. Um, but I mean, you're going to do a full setup. You're 10 grand plus. Yeah. You know, there's, there's a lot of ways to spend that money to make your business run properly. And yeah. it's, it's doesn't all happen on site. It just doesn't. No. no, no. And you don't have to go spend 10 grand either. There's easier ways to get into the auto tools, right? Oh, you totally. Tube and like mm -hmm. lots of ways, you know, and maybe that's how you start instead of spending 10 grand. Actually, I had a call with somebody not long ago and they were going out to buy a new set of tools mm -hmm. and they were talking to me about business coaching. And they decided to buy the tools. And I was like, fuck, man, that was, I don't know. <laughs> Quite the decision, but it's your decision. You know, you don't know how to run them. And like, you get this, uh, 
this bazooka that's like you think it's going to save you money i was literally on the other podcast today we were talking about my first bazooka when i got one yeah the first house that i did on piecework was thirty thousand square feet and i convinced the guy that i was doing the piecework for to give me the money to buy a bazooka yep so that i could get it done faster i was like that's literally going to solve my problems i already knew how to run boxes and stuff and i could run an angle box and i had a bit of tools and i just needed that bazooka and i got that thing and it slowed me down I went from slot box to bazooka. I had an old guy that uh, worked for me and he was teaching me how to use it. But like, man, it was brutal. It's not but overnight, man. No, no, yeah. no. It was, it was hard, man. I, I made tapes too long or too short for quite some time. Oh, yeah. 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 And I mean, it. it everything's going to have a learning curve, right? Like I, I started calling the bazooka like a sword, right? It, yeah. it is. It is like a absolute weapon mm-hmm. with a swordsman. Yeah. If you give it to a librarian, they're not going to do much yeah. with it. Yeah. Right. It's the same thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. You. Yeah. They do though. Like you, you, the the auto tools is like jumping into another whole thing. Like you, oh, you yeah. can't you can't do ten thousand board feet by hand in in five days or whatever. Maybe no. you can. Maybe you can. Yeah. I'd, you'd, I'd be, love, you'd, be, you'd be flying. <laughs> I'd love to see it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then it comes down to like with the bazooka, it's not just about knowing how to run it. Cause I've seen guys that can run it. Mm-hmm. It's fixing that goddamn thing and yeah. troubleshooting it when it goes down. Cause there's nothing worse. Like I used to go, I'd tape like three houses in a day. Sometimes I'd have five guys behind me wiping yeah. tape. Yeah. But when that fucking thing went down and like a, a feeder pin broke, Yep. or the chain broke or the cutter spring broke or like whatever happened now like you gotta macgyver that thing quickly and get it back together or you're literally just down and out and usually you can't just go to the hardware store and get a new cable for a bazooka so like you gotta find a way to like tie that thing back on only pump it up eight times instead of ten so you don't blow it off the back again like yeah that's what you gotta really be really be good at because it's one thing to run it it's another thing to maintain it and troubleshoot it and I'm, and I'm absolutely spoiled now because of the stuff with Columbia, and I get that. But yeah. when I'm talking to people about tools now, when I show up to site to tape, I bring two tapers. Yeah. I have three I tapers have. now. Yeah, and I've it's... got like six now, but that was yeah. that was never the, no. the thing. I have one. <laughs> but what I mean by that is like, I don't, I don't stop if it gets clogged up. Yeah. If they both do, then we stop. Yeah. You know, yeah. but it's like you're, you know, when does yeah. that happen? Never. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, awesome that you have two. This whole tool thing now where everybody's got all these tools. Like, yeah, it's crazy. Oh, it's nuts. Um, I've got a short handle that I like. It's like, um, it's just the mini matrix handle and then it drops yeah. down. So if I'm doing like eight or nine feet, that's all I need. Yeah. Uh, and then I've got the long handle that's like uh, five feet or, or something like that. And before I was uh, swapping them out, right? I would do everything that I could reach and then I would swap it out and do everything that I could reach again. When yeah. we were just in Barry, we had double and triple of everything. So we just had both going, mm-hmm. right? Like ha- awesome. have both handles attached, have both boxes running, just grab it, grab and go, grab yeah. and go. Yeah. And then, as long as you're the one setting up your boxes, they're all the same. Oh, if yeah. if they're set up for you, um, yeah. you know, like I, I'm an enormous person. So mm-hmm. the way that I push and run a box is very different than somebody using leverage. Uh, yeah. you, do you know what I mean? Like you, you really yeah. have to dial your own stuff in as well. It all kind of comes down to that too, with the auto tools is like, it does take time. It, it speeds things up immensely running an yeah. angle box as opposed to a tube and flusher is very different. Yeah. Um, but once you dial it in and you've got your mud consistency figured out and all that kind of stuff for you, um, you know, you're flying. Oh yeah. Yeah. It just, it takes time. Yeah, it takes time. And when you're starting out and you can only like now they have like the tool kits. I guess they had them back then, too, but I could never afford a kit. Yeah. So I'm like, I bought pieces like totally. my first my first set of boxes. Um, the old guy that I got to come work for me, he was an old drywaller. And he's like, oh, I got a set of flat boxes. I can I can give you to uh, get you going. He's like, they're just out in the shed. So <laughs> we go to the shed. The shed is just a fenced in area. Yeah, it's like a dead mouse in it. And... Dude, there's no roof. Cool. <laughs> It's just a fenced in area. And he kicks the grass on the ground. And all of a sudden, this tape tech flat box comes flying out. It's like <sighs> buried in the mud. He's got yeah. an eight, a 10 and a 12. And he's got this old flat box handle. And it's got that old pin style that yep. would like wear out and slip. 
and it was worn out. So I had to like grind it to a point again and try and make it work. And then it was missing the pin on the, on the handle. So I had a three and a half inch nail through there, bent over, uh -huh. and like came off the wall wrong. It would hit you in the stomach. <laughs> so it was, it was crazy, man. And there was no like online ordering tools back then either. So no. like, I had to drive to lose drywall. That's where I got my first bazooka. And if I wanted parts, I had to like make a parts list. Okay. What do I need? I'm going down to the hmm. city. I got to grab all this shit. Then all wall came out yes. and I started to order stuff off there, but it was so expensive to ship it across the border. And you had to buy a bunch of stuff at once and you had to make sure you got everything you needed. And then they ship it and you're like, ah, oh, shit, why didn't I get that too? I should have got one of those. And so it's very hard to find parts and everything. So I think everybody's a little spoiled now. All these tool companies are like giving tools away. And I was like, mm -hmm. I'm picking up old flat boxes out of the, out of the mud with like seized wheels. I couldn't even run the wheels. Yeah. You're dragging it. I had, to, I had to keep it down a little bit and just run That's it on crazy. the way. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the biggest things that CSR has done, in my opinion, is it's yeah. like North America wide, probably yeah. worldwide, if you wanted to pay the shipping. Yeah, uh, You just order it and it doesn't take long to get there. And it's the yeah. entire thing. If you walk into CSR and want 10 Columbia flat boxes, they've got them. Yeah. There's never a question. Yeah. It's like, if you is... come here and you are looking for something, yeah, I mean, like other than like north star or whatever yes, like i was just gonna say unless it's north star <laughs> yeah and and i mean that's that's not a bad thing either man like i mean if you're running that stuff and 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 you like the way that mark's done things which i mean a lot of people do yeah. it's you you just have to be smarter about it when you see stuff buy it you don't yeah. need it today you do need it though have, have um, you ran that stuff like no, Aaron no, Aaron would either. Uh, Aaron would cry. Oh, yeah, I think. Like, yeah. <laughs> and, and I and I never want to look at anybody and be like, I was running other tools, and either I like yeah. it or I don't like it. I bleed yeah. black, man. Like I'm yeah. Columbia through and through, and you know, I don't know, it's, man. It's, it's this... crazy you say that you bleed black because like Columbia to me is blue. I know, right? Yeah. I'm I'm old school, man. My first my first taper has the little blue, the slick guy on it. Like, yeah, I, I still have that thing, man. It's it's wild how much it's worn out. So one of my favorite things about that particular taper is that ridge on the, on the cut sleeve yeah. where it, it, awesome. it kind of comes out that little bit and you can hit it yeah. with your fingers. Um, yeah. The uh, Brad like Frankenstein one up and it's a predator, but it's got that cut sleeve on it. He's got like a bunch of uh, like spikes and stuff on it. He, he's got a, that. it's the coolest thing, man. Did you, put, and, did you put an extension on that thing? Bro. So this extension, you know, from the cut sleeve up to the chain. No, uh, that, I knew that's what it was. Yeah. yeah it, it's in, it's upside down. And yeah. then it, it goes up like a bolt of a, of a yeah. gun uh, and it catches on one of the spikes. And then when you need it, yeah. like it is dope for standups. Yeah. And, and when you're not, you also have that little lip. Um, it's cool, man. It's a cool I, idea. Uh, I have an extension. Okay. Tape tech used to make an extension. Yeah, I think you can still get it from Ames. Okay. But I think Tape Tech discontinued it. But it's like an extra two. Right. You, like you still have the, the creaser trigger on the bottom. It just comes with an extra cable up to the creaser trigger. And now your creaser trigger is lower. Oh. And uh, it's got a, a rod that comes down that connects to the cutter sleeve. And it's got a little ball on it. So yeah. it extends the whole thing. And then you just have this little ball and you just pull that down. It's like a little awkward to run, but wicked for 12 foot standups you know yeah. you can reach when you're a shorter guy and like you can tape 12 foot ceilings from the floor and, or I, I can well i think most guys can do like 10 but yeah it's uh it's pretty cool and it just like clamps on and you hook up the uh the creaser extension and hook the thing up to the cutter sleeve and you're ready to rock yeah and then it's uh it's pretty wild, man. When we were out in surrey aaron's made a six foot taper and then there was like two of them or something danny's got it and yeah, it's really cool. Mm -hmm. But after I run this thing, I don't, I don't think I need it, man. It, no, I like that. I like that. It's small. It's not clunky. You yeah. can reach up and grab that. That's uh, that's really nice. And you say you like move it. So it's not always hooked up. Like, does it swivel? Yeah. So it, it it'll come up and then swivel in and then, nice. it, so there's a spike on the top of it that just locks into place. But like, I mean, it's simple enough to make, like he made yeah. this in his garage, dude. Like, yeah, I, I I've known Brad for a long time. Um, and now that I'm kind of taping at a level that he wants to show me some cool stuff, like he, he's made a lot of really cool stuff. I'm not going to talk about it, but I mean, when you're going through it, you're like, what the fuck is this? Mm -hmm. And he's like, 
look at what this is. And then he'll walk you through it. And it's simple enough. You could be making your own stuff. Like, yeah. And if you go and buy a handle and then take it apart and modify it, I don't think Columbia cares, man. You bought the handle. Do whatever you want yeah. with it. Yeah, they, they should uh, actually they should actually be seeing what people are doing and collaborating and like totally you know, taking some of these little tricks. You know, that's uh, I did on the other podcast this morning. I was talking to Nick about uh, trim techs and how they like take ideas from people and you know from their customers and use them. And I remember when yes. I met Joe, uh, the owner, he said that the way they came up with the flat tearaway. Have you used the flat tearaway before? Oh, totally. Yeah, that is awesome. So you don't have to leave the gap or anything. Great for like button up against windows. Mm -hmm. He literally saw a guy on site one time and he was taking the normal tear away and he cut the half inch <laughs> lip off and just folded it. You know, he just scored it, folded it, snapped it off. And the guy stuck it up there. He's like, damn, there's a new product, man. I, I wish I could know how many linear feet that I've cut that tab off of before I realized that there was a flat tear away. The, the flat's amazing, man. And it's amazing. like around, around uh, tubs and like around, yeah. you know, all that kind of stuff. Like, yeah. Cause sometimes the borders are ramming that right up next to it. They do. And, and then you're and, trying to like carve it out and it makes a mess and you don't have a broom. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a nightmare, right? It just makes more work. It does. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, they're not stupid over there at Columbia, man. It's if there's a good idea, they're, they're pretty well all over it. Yeah. Um, and I don't think there's any thieving going on. I think it's like, good idea. What do you yeah. want for that? Yeah. Um, and then there are also a bunch of people that think that they are inventors and like, you know, it's, it, that's a whole other thing too. But I mean, if you're on site working every day and something is working easier for you, you should, you ought to be reaching out to companies being like, Hey man, did you know that I do this? Yeah. Cause it's smart. Yeah. Yeah. We, we invent stuff all the time. Uh, I'll give one example. We were always uh, boarding off a scissor lift. Oh yeah. And like the old school way to board off a scissor lift is do you grab the sheet and you stick your toes Yes. Out the scissor lift and you hold it with your toes or if you're like doing dance class outside right same thing holding your toes i was like why don't we just make a hook yeah we still with just, studs it just hooks on there so i literally just had a guy bend me up a hook and like weld it and shit and now we have these hooks that we throw in the scissor lift and you just lift the sheet up put it on the hooks take the button up like so we started easy. we started getting in trouble because we were getting the heavy gauge studs and all the cutoffs at the end we would cut those in half and then kelly screw them into the side of the lift and and then you would have that little bit of a section, right? So you could you could lift it over, put it yeah. on the hooks, readjust, and then put it yeah. up into it. It was a a short lived thing. I think yeah, one, you can't, one... You can't screw it into lift. No, <laughs> yeah. you're not allowed. We we had our our hooks just ended up hooking on to the side of it, and then before that, when we were doing exterior dance class, it had like a a mesh floor in the lift. Mm -hmm. So I literally just took a two by four. And I grabbed a couple of wood screws and washers and went through the mesh floor and had the two by four just extend out. Brilliant. Past, past the basket. And then you just like throw it on there. And then I got the idea for the hooks. I was like, we could use this on everything because there's no mesh basket in a scissor lift. Like, yeah, we'll just make these hooks and they're, they're universal. Yeah, that's brilliant. I want to go back to what you were talking about, um, what the customer's paying for. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Nate, uh, Nate from uh, Nathan's Drywall, he came up with like a good, better, best scenario where it's like, do you just want this two coated and out? Do you want this the best that it could possibly be? Do you want like something in the middle? That's and awesome. like, and the, and the very best is like all level five stuff. If that's what needs to be done and you'll have a huge warranty on the back end of it, I'll use the best products possible. Like all of that kind of stuff. Or do you just want me in and out of here because you don't care because I tend to do that best possible on everything. And if yeah. somebody doesn't want to pay top dollar for it, I don't want to leave something behind. That's not like that. Yeah. Um, so I just turn stuff down now. I'd sorry. Right. I don't do, I don't do shitty work. I'm sorry. Yeah. You found your niche. Right. But for somebody that's just looking for work all over the place it, it, yeah. and also realizing when somebody brings you in at a low price with some sort of, this is what we're looking for. When they're not happy with it, you need to be able to say, hey, that was an option and is still an option, but it yeah. doesn't cost the same. And yeah. those those types of conversations are really hard because I think a lot of people think that's the end of the relationship. But mm -hmm. I'll, I'll tell you, any relationship that I have with anybody, if you are misleading me or lying to me, we're done. Yeah. But if I choose something, and it's not what I'm looking for. And there's an option behind it. I fully understand that. Oh yeah. Like, okay. No, I see it now. So yeah. what is it? 
uh, or what is it on the next one? And can you help yeah. me out on this one or something like, you know, like it, that, yeah. that's, that's all part of building relationships. I think, I think some people struggle though with difficult conversations. Yeah. Yeah. Like I mean, set, set, setting boundaries and, you know, like confronting people and not exploding, it's just, especially in the construction world, man. It seems like everybody's exploding all the time. They can't keep their temper under control. And I was famous for that man like exploding all the time and thought that like yelling is how you get things done because i don't know i guess it's how i grew up and then mm -hmm. people that i worked for that's just kind of how it was i worked for lots of old school guys and they all yelled and screamed and drank beer at the end of the day and i thought that was that's being a man right yeah exactly i uh when i started running crews i was very young so there was always that headbutt of they're better than me and i would put my pouch on and kick their ass or it's like okay so now we're done with the fact that you think you're better than me let's move on and then yeah. the, the next headache was always that escalation mm -hmm. of like i'm upset you know and it's like i don't care that you're yeah. upset you're here to do your job and i used to have conversations with these guys of like when you're purple yelling i see you crying yeah. literally yeah, because you have no control over your emotions, emotions at all yeah so it's like yeah. i i see a child crying right now and yeah. i mean when you tell people that and i think they go home and they think about it because yeah. it's exactly the same thing it's you oh, are it's, you are you're you're uh exposing your emotions to get your way yeah. Children, it's, children do that, dude. It's, it's called a tantrum. It is a tantrum. That's exactly, <laughs> it's, it's, that's exactly it's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> some kids cry, some kids yell, and some adults do the same thing, man. And yeah. most men, you know, they're told not to cry, so they yell. And they yeah. try and lead with intimidation. Yeah. And I think that is all changing. As the new generations are coming up, kids are a lot different now. Totally. They're getting a lot better, expressing their feelings. And like us, like our age group, you know, we're like definitely in that transition phase where we allow our kids to have space to mm -hmm. express their emotions and stuff. Whereas, uh, you know, maybe our parents didn't allow that so much mm -hmm. from the generation we come from. So I think we are in that transition, which is good, which is going to make better adults eventually. For sure. A kinder, kinder yeah. adults for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, being emotional and like being open about that was always a weakness growing up but it really is a strength yeah. you know, when when you kind of have the balls to tell somebody that you're overwhelmed right now and these are the reasons for that like it shouldn't be talked down on it should be no. taught yeah. better were you or able to do that with what were you, were you able to do that express your emotions like that always and yeah and... so i was an absolute fuse until i was about 28 yeah. And then uh, I went and got it all figured out, man. Like it, it's um, everybody is so wound up with control and things like that. But when you are out of control emotionally, then, then there is no control. Yes. Right. So yeah, man, if I get overwhelmed with stuff, I'm the first one to say it like, Hey, yeah. this is super overwhelming. Can someone explain to me why? Like, why are we put under this much pressure? Why are we being paid this when we're doing that? Like, and yeah. having a simple conversation with somebody, you get the outcome that you're looking for. And sometimes yeah. the answer is too fucking bad, yeah. but at least, but at least you understand that. And then that goes back to that. Is this a company I want to work for? Yeah. If, if the answer is it's too bad all the time, maybe it's too bad to work here. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, as the worker, you're the one bringing in the money, man. Like, and I know that, uh, like you've got a big business, so, yeah. you know, you really are in control. Um, but without the guys on site, without the right guys on site, the yeah. business doesn't run good. It's like not wow. the, the, the well oiled machine has shitty oil in it. Yeah. Um, and you I mean, gotta, that all come, sorry, go ahead. You've got to create that culture. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's what we realized is like, we're hiring millennials. So that's that's the new hire right like that age group the whatever it is now 20 to 40 yeah. like in that range is where we're hiring right the guys north of 40 they're kind of set in their ways yeah uh so like the new group of people is at 20 to 40 and what they want is like a good culture they'll take less money mm -hmm. over good culture where the guys north of 40 will typically take the more money 
and just be grumpy all day and grind it out just because they're making a couple extra bucks. And now guys don't do that. That's why I think so many guys have went it on their own and do their own work now and are like smaller crews because they get to have fun at work. They get to work for a couple GCs. They're not being run all over the place on jobs and they enjoy that. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's huge. It's having that culture. And I think that's what my company has done a good job of is creating that culture. And like, we're a new age company, man. Like we're not like these old school drywall companies where it's very cut and dry and like you supply all your own tools. And if we give you a screw gun, you've got to use this corded one. And like, we like yeah. literally give the guys a Hilti bag when they show up with all brand new tools in it. They've got corded guns, you know, a cord, a cord cordless gun, cordless mm -hmm. rotor zip, like everything's in the bag, man, ready to go. Like use good tools. You know, we're very flexible with scheduling and stuff. It's not that rigid. You got to be here from seven to four 30. If you're going to drop your kids off at school in the morning and that's the setup you have with us that you don't show up till eight, eight 30. Cool. Right. Yeah. If you're going to leave on Tuesdays early to go do whatever, like, just let us know what's going on so we can schedule that accordingly. We, we try and work with everybody and have a very open uh, atmosphere for everyone. Well, and that openness is a big thing. Um, you know, again, I'll bring up Nate. Nate is an absolute pleasure to have on site. He's very good at his job, mm -hmm. uh, but he gets his kids on the bus every day and he yeah. picks them up from the bus every day. Yeah. And that's his schedule, dude. And it doesn't change. It's that's not like, every it's other day. Hour window, man. <laughs> well, and like, it's a different thing on, on this day and that day and every other week, it's a different thing that is dicking people around when you yeah. have a schedule that I can trust. Yeah. You know, nobody cares that, that, no. you know, on, on Thursdays you go pick up your kid or, or you're, you got a ball game or you're coaching soccer or whatever it mm -hmm. is. It's companies just need to know that you're reliable from yeah. A to B to Z, or, you know, and, and that's what is what it is. And it's not going to change and it's not mm -hmm. going to be this different thing every week and excuses and all this other kind of crap. Like you have to have a life outside of work. Yeah. And you also have to have a place that you feel safe at, yeah. at work. Um, I always told, said that to the people that I was leading was like, if you don't feel like you're going to have a job tomorrow, that's a huge problem. You yeah. need to be focused on working, not focused on trying to keep your job. That's my job to yeah. make sure that you're safe, to make sure that you feel good, to, to make sure that you know what you're doing. You know, that's a leadership position, not a worker's position. Yeah. Um, yeah. So building that community, man, it's, it's, it's huge. Um, you know, we have some of the best finishers around coming to these uh, collaborations that we're doing. Yeah. And, and by the end of it all, a lot of them are like, I'd have done this for free. Yeah, because it was probably a lot, lot of probably fun. a lot of fun, man. I'd I'd love to come just just where I'd come work for free. I've yeah, been on the tools in so long. It'd be great to just come and <laughs> pound in a bunch of footage. Yeah, and it's a good atmosphere. Everybody's yeah. having fun all day long. And when you're not having fun, why? Because you've been doing this all day. Go do something else. Like we're yeah. all capable of doing it. Nobody has to run the taper because they're the only one that knows how to do it. We all yeah. know how to do everything. Yeah. So it's yeah, I see. It, my, my business got to the point when I was doing everything that I just got like sick of it. Yeah. You know, and I was doing the same thing. Like when I was doing houses, I was doing hundred houses a year, it was the same bullshit over and over again. No heat stairs aren't in, you know, like just the same crap over and over and over. And like, it was monotonous. And I was ran like, I guess like a, like a robot almost, you know, mm -hmm. like there was, I couldn't take days off because there was always another house to go to. And then that would bleed down into my guys and, you know, I'd have to like run them super hard and we'd have to do a certain amount of footage a day and like trying to board a house a day. It's crazy. It's, it's nuts. Trying to tape houses in three, four days, you know, and like doing two at a time, you're bouncing around. It's, it's insane. Yeah. You know, it's insane. It's not a, it's not a good life. It's not a well, good life. But having two teams, two reliable teams, as opposed to having one team bouncing all over the place, it's like, how much money do you want to make, man? Like, like you were saying before, the old timers want to make that money, but how much yeah. of that are you spending on booze to go home and get drunk? Cause you're miserable. Yeah. Like do that math yeah, and then de that's... deduct that from your year end. And that's what you want to make and be happy. I, I did that math. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, did, I did that math. The one year I spent, my wife was going over all the bills. She's like, you've spent $8,000 just on your visa this year at the beer store. She's like, that doesn't include anything you bought for cash. That yeah. doesn't include you going to the bar. That doesn't include you drinking anybody else's beer. Like that's literally just your visa. Yep. What is that? $4 like, an hour? 
I don't know. It was, Something it like was that? Nuts. It was nuts, man. And it finally, it all came to a head. I actually, uh, when did I get sober? 20, 2019. Yeah, good for you. Sober. Yeah. And, and was that like it was a problem or it was just in the way? Uh, a bit of both. Yeah. A bit of both. Like I'd, I'd really slow down, but then I would like still go out like that once a month mm -hmm. and fuck everything up. Right. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I'd be like a celebration that I was something good happened or something bad happened or just, I was stressed or whatever. And then like, I'd go out and I'd party so hard. I'd be fucked for like a week. Yeah. And then I'd like have to close a job on Monday and I'd like miss closing this job, miss sending in that price. And I just like beat myself up for a week and like be so low, you know, and it takes a lot to bring yourself back up from that. And then I would, I, do good for a while and then fucking boom, you just get this idea yeah. in your head. I should go do that again. And like, it's a terrible idea. <laughs> so it just, it had to go. It was like messing with my life and it was affecting a big portion of it. Like I said, like the hangovers like turned into a week from one night out. Yeah. You're not 20 anymore. Yeah. 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 It, it really dragged out. I think a lot of people also don't understand that alcohol is a depressant, man. Yeah. If you are drinking all the time and you think everything sucks. Yeah. You know, do some thinking about that. Yeah. Try to drink some water. <laughs> and, and yeah, if you were taking depression pills and then going, I'm depressed, everyone would go, yeah. no shit. You know? Yeah. Um, and yeah, somebody told me this year that drinking is borrowing happiness from tomorrow. And then eventually mm. that, that jar is empty. That is great. It, it was a heavy one, man, because I, I was a big drink. My whole family's been big drinkers my whole life. Like, and I've never seen it get shitty and I've never seen it ruin someone's life. Yeah. So the, there was a point in my life that it was just normal to do that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then you start to kind of open your eyes up a little bit where you're like, oh, oh, this doesn't work for everybody. Yeah. And like, and why doesn't it work for everybody? Oh, does it not work for me? Mm -hmm. And then you start taking a look at stuff, right? Like, I've cut my drinking way, way back. And I mean, on the days that I do, you're down the next day, a hundred percent. And you might not be hung over, but you're not happy. Like you're not running on full cylinders. It's it, that out. It, it is different, man. Yeah, and it, you feel it, different. And it bleeds into stuff too. Like yeah. I've met a lot of guys that are a mess yeah. and, and their work's good, but they're yeah. a mess. I've, and I've it, had lots of guys work for me that like, fantastic tapers fantastic borders but like literally spending all their money on drugs and alcohol and their life's a fucking mess they don't have no foundation and i didn't either somehow i literally built this empire i built like i just quit drinking in 2020 i have yeah. battled with drinking and drugs since i was like 13 years old yeah i literally at 16 i ended up homeless and overdosed you yeah. know oh, like, shit yeah crazy so i yeah. like battled it the whole time built this business somehow while having this fucking demon in the background all the time playing and then trying to go to work on Monday and be this businessman. I'm building the business. And then like Friday comes or usually fucking Thursday or Wednesday comes. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, the next three days are just insane. And I'm going to work and I'm just like nuts in my head and I'm yelling at people. And I realize, you know, like it's not me. I'm just like, I got no sleep. I'm fucked yeah. up all the time. I'm yelling, screaming because I'm just like so crazy in my head with everything that's going on. And I'm just like destroying my life. Yeah. And, and it, it's an imbalance, dude. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's not good. And so many people in the trades deal with that as the norm. Like that's how I grew mm -hmm. up. Everybody I knew in the trades, all my buddies, dads, like we would drink with them, you know, as we got older and we started getting construction jobs, we'd start hanging out with these dudes and like, it was normal. Yeah. And that, that normality of it all, um, that there, there's a lot of problems in the industry like that. Like, um, we talk about a lot of, of women in the trades and like the shit that they go through. Yeah. And I don't think a lot of the younger people are meaning to do it. I think it's just the norm of the jokes and all that kind of shit on site. And then it's just yeah. now they're more prevent, like they're more present. Yeah. You, you just see more women on sites and then it's like, oh, well now what do we do? Like it shouldn't have been a thing in the first place. Yeah. Um, you know, going out and drinking with people after work to build relationships really shouldn't be happening in the first place. You should be able yeah. to build those relationships through working and teaching and yeah. uh, succeeding as a team, all of yeah. those types of things. But until you have like a company like yours that has somebody at the helm that understands that or yeah. the right leadership in place in a company, mm -hmm. um, 
you know, you just, you just don't see it. And uh, like, I can remember very vividly taking the new guys out for drinks and like yeah. celebrating our successes and then yeah, everybody feeling like a bag of shit the next day. So you get another beer the next day. Like yeah. it's the yeah. same thing. Yeah. It's not good. I used to do the same. I would drink with employees. I had friends and family working for me, <laughs> partying with them on the weekend and weeknights and we'd work away in hotels and like drinking every night. And yeah, that's not a way to like, that's not a company. No, it's just it's a bunch a of dudes. house. Yeah, it's a bunch of dudes doing fucking drywall and getting drunk every night. That's all it was, you know? And then I turned it into a company eventually. I yeah. got my shit together and figured it out. It's cool to see, though, that it's, um, you know, it's it's not like you're some Harvard grad that you came up with some stuff. Like, it's like, just put your head down, I'm, man. Figure it out. I'm, I'm a normal guy who figured shit out. I didn't even finish high school. Like, yeah. I didn't even make it out of there alive. I was working full-time doing drywall at 16, and I just you know, had a dream and kept working hard. Um, like persistence wins every time. Yes. Every time. Yeah. doesn't matter how skilled you are. If you're not persistent and keep going after it, it's not going to happen. Well, and like discipline is something that is brought up all the time and you see it on uh, reels all the time, but discipline isn't like a light switch that turns on and off. It's just something that you do and you're going to do again tomorrow and you're going to do again tomorrow you know, like there are these things that are like, um, you know, are you not going to drink for the rest of your life? I don't know, but today mm -hmm. I'm not going to. Yeah. And then you, you wake up tomorrow and you say today, I'm not going to, or today I'm going to go to the gym. Yeah. And, and, and are you, am I going to go to the gym tomorrow? I don't know. But when I wake up in the morning, I'm going to make the decision to go today. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. And that's what discipline is, is, yeah. is doing the things that you don't want to do because you're deciding to each day, not a month from now, not I'm going to do it for five years. And that seems like a lot. So I'm not going to do it. Yeah. It, it, yeah, man, you're knocking them out of the park here. This is great. <laughs> this conversation is <laughs> way away from drywall, but it's been good. Oh yeah. <laughs> I think it all relates. So it like, it does. It all goes back to like having that foundation and having your life together. Like if you don't have your life together, you don't have discipline. How are you ever going to build a business? Mm -hmm. Right. Why would anybody trust you to like, you know, drywall their big house? If your life's a mess and you open the door and there's beer cans falling out and like, you know, <laughs> it, it doesn't, it doesn't work. It's crazy, dude. It's yeah. uh, one of the things that I have here written down is, um, industry and then pricing and then commercial versus residential. And we kind of touched on that. Mm -hmm. um, did you do much high end residential as opposed to commercial? Like, what are your thoughts on that kind of thing? Because the, the timelines on a high end residential site are way different than like large commercial sites. Yeah. So I did do some high end residential, but I could never charge enough for it. I, I found yeah. It just like wasn't there back then where people want to like pay for drywall. I feel like it's a lot more prevalent now, especially like you've got all these trimless houses and shit and like it's people crazy. Want level five stuff. And like, it's, it's wild. I don't feel like it was there as much back then. Like, uh, but what I didn't like about the like custom home Avenue, it was a little bit more money, um, but it was all over the place and I couldn't scale it. And I wanted to scale mm. it. I wanted to like have a bunch of guys. I don't know. I just had this dream to have a bunch of, bunch of guys and a bunch of crews and shit. And it was really hard for me to like run over here to this house and then run over here to that house. It was a lot of running around and I just really wanted a subdivision. So I had yes. steady work and I could just like look down the street and like see my year, you know? And that yep. was, that was huge once I finally got that. So I do see a lot of guys do that now, you know, and uh, they just like focus on the high end residential. They can make mm -hmm. really good money at it. I always wanted volume and I'd work for way less just because I wanted to be the big guy, I guess. I, I mean, I've had that conversation with people too, where it's like, you know, are you going to do um, townhouses for 35 cents? And that seems like it's not a lot of money, but when you can smash through 10 or 15,000 board feet in a week, it's pretty good money. Pretty well, yeah. But it's yeah. It, it also goes into how much work are you going to put in and what's your system and all those types of things that we were talking about before. Yeah. Um. So hard questions. Like, how do you deal with those types of things of, you know, your guys are coming in at X amount of money. These guys are coming in at two thirds that price. Like, how do you deal with that kind of stuff? Or do you even, or do you just move? Do I, do, do I deal with that now? Or, or like, how did you deal with it as you were building this business? That's 
literally the reason I switched to commercial. Yeah, that's and what I thought. Now that I'm in the commercial world, I don't really deal with that. I still do, but we're to a size where like we have like one competitor who's union and right. they get a bunch of jobs. We get a bunch of jobs. And then there is a couple guys that will beat us on jobs sometimes, but they have like three, four, five, six employees. So they get a job and then they're busy. Yeah. Right? So it doesn't really affect us. Like, sure, you can have that $300,000 job and that's going to keep you busy for like six months, right? Yeah. So we're to that point where it doesn't really matter. But that's, yeah, the whole residential thing before I got so frustrated with it. Like when I stopped working for the builder I was doing 100 houses a year for, I really lucked out getting in with him and uh, having all that steady work for like five, six years. Mm -hmm. But when I got away from that and I kind of started doing commercial, I was still trying to price residential. Like, fuck, I need another subdivision, right? Like I need another site. It'd be nice to have a residential site. And I priced shit, 10, 15 sites. Right. And I could not get another one for the numbers that I wanted. And I was like, even pricing against union companies who I thought would be more than me mm -hmm. were beating me by like 20%. Wow. Like, which is like your profit <laughs> what is going on here man and like if you've ever you know worked for some of those companies it's uh it's pretty wild to do piece work for them and yeah. uh, get like shortage on shorted on footage and like nothing's ever ready and the house is a mess and like i can see why they can do it a lot cheaper because i ran a totally different type of site they're like their volume was so large my hundred has years nothing compared to what they're doing right right so I could see why they were much cheaper, but yeah, I just, I literally had to stop doing residential. I said, I'm not doing it anymore because two guys with a Honda Civic and a, a two-step and a, a drywall gun are now, you know, they're a drywall company. Yeah. And that's, that's hard to compete with when you've got trucks and tools and an office yeah. and like all these things. Right. So I don't deal with that, you know, so much anymore, but I definitely did back then. And that's kind of what fueled where I went in the business world. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I find that a lot. It's uh, sometimes you will see people or you'll sub out to people that show up in a Honda Civic and it's like, what yeah. happens if you need scaffolding or like yeah. you need to go pick up a plank or like if you yeah. need to, what that's on me. Yeah. Why is it on me? You're the one doing the job. Yeah. You know, and, or, or why was this not brought up prior? Like things like that, like new, new yeah. people. Yeah. Um, and I mean, yeah. Uh, when I started using the Hilti guns, like those screws are like 300 bucks a box and a, yeah. a box of regular screws at the store is like 80 bucks or whatever. Yeah. So my cousin back then said, you know, if your consumables are what's making or breaking your company, there's a real problem there. Yeah. Like, or, and, and what I mean to say by that is like, I've got a truck, it's like a thousand bucks a month. Yeah. And when somebody shows up in a small car, um, you know, they don't have that overhead and like no. somebody that doesn't have an office and somebody that doesn't have a project manager and all those yeah. types of things, like they're going to win right off the bat because they don't have the overhead. But these are also typically yes, the people. Yes and no. Right. Yeah, was, yes, and, yes and no. Yeah. Because the, these are typically the people that aren't, their business isn't making any money. Yes. yes. They're making the so, money. Well, so what were you going to say? So that's, that's kind of what I like to dive into with people is, um, you know, it's up to you to show people why they should pay you more. Because a lot of times, sure, you've got the dude with the Honda Civic that pulls up and sure you pull up in a nicer truck, but if you're just a guy with a business card, just like that guy was just a guy with a business card, maybe he parked down the street, they didn't even see his card, yeah. right? All they're doing is comparing your prices. Right. But when you've got that Instagram following, yes. and you have a Google listing with a bunch of reviews, and you have a website, right? And you've got all this stuff and you build trust with people through all that, then you're worth more. It's like, right. you know, if, if you, if your toilet backs up, you've got shit all over the floor, all of a sudden you like Google plumber in your area and you're going to see a guy with 2.3 stars. Mm -hmm. You scroll past that dude. Yeah. You're right? not, you're not unless, calling that guy. Unless you're some like shitty landlord who's looking for a really cheap job. You're going to click yeah. that guy maybe, but like to have some guy come into your house you're looking for the guy that has good reviews and has a reputation has a website and you can check him out on uh, Instagram and uh, all that. Right. Mm -hmm. Your, your video froze for a second. It was a good, oh, yeah. you froze like too. did we catch it? Yeah. No, the audio was good. Record it. Yeah. So we got the yeah. audio. It's good. Oh yeah. But yeah. That's, that's the thing, right? Like if you're just comparing price, they're going to go with the cheaper price, but if you 100%. can show your value, right? Like, that's why we get a lot of the work that we do now because we have the value and we've proven the people and we've built our reputation. And like, sometimes people will go with us when our price is more, 
because they know, yeah. hey, that's that's uh, that price is too low. I can mm -hmm. tell that that's going to be a bad decision, especially when you get on like some of these jobs that are, you know, like a couple million dollars for us, million dollars, mm -hmm. whatever. Like where you're there six months, a year. If you get in bed with the wrong drywall company, and like just because of a cheap price, and then you get stuck with these guys, and they don't have the manpower, and they're doing shit work, and they're not finishing, and then the clients looking at the general contractor like, who the hell did you hire here? You know, like yeah. That's a sticky situation. And them. it looks bad on you yeah. or, or whoever chose to bring whoever them chose, in. Which is um, yeah, typically the GC, right? Anytime when I was running sites that I was able to sit in on those conversations and they were like, but yeah, but this guy's like X number of dollars cheaper. Right. The, ch the cheapest bid, 100% has forgotten something. Yeah. They, they just have. Yeah. And, and, and it, that is just what it is. Because the, you know, two and three and four, they're using different products. Yeah. Uh, they're doing different processes and they, they, you know, cost a little bit more, or a little bit less, but the bottom bid absolutely has forgotten something. Yeah. And when it's not in your scope of work and, and everybody has signed off on those terms, when it comes to doing the level five for the walls or the fireproofing or whatever was not on the contract, they now yeah. have you by the balls. Oh, and yeah. there are people that do that on purpose. Yep. Because who are you going to find to come in today or next week to do that? And, and who's going to come on to a site with a different drywall company to pick up one specific, nobody. No way. No, it's, um, terrible. it's terrible. So it's either a strategy or these people suck. And I but mean, some, sometimes it's a strategy. We literally, 100%. we literally just walked on a job not long ago. We priced this job submitted the price and then they reached out to us. They wanted to have a meeting. So they had the meeting and then they wanted to have another meeting to make sure that we had included everything and go over the scope. And I was like, no, yep, done. done. Pull the plug. Like we obviously missed something. And instead of them telling us like, Hey, you guys are super low. Yeah. They were trying to trap us. And I was like, no, you guys like said to my estimator and my, my VP, like you guys missed something. They're trying to trap you. I've been down this road before. I've literally yeah. seen this happen to other trades and seen it try and happen to myself. Like, no, just pull the plug. They're dishonest. Let's not, let's not. It's sneaky. Sneaky as hell. It's Try super and sneaky. Something and like, literally, what are they going to like bankrupt your company to get a good deal on a job? Like, what, yeah, well, what they're happy of, to. That's, that's insane. It you know, is. It's insane. so nuts. Um, we were doing uh, like a new office reno. And it was one of the last projects that I did with this company. Uh, and not because I left on bad terms. I just started doing this. Uh, yeah. yeah, I was just happier doing it. But uh, they had a relationship with a guy prior before he had like 15 people and they were tight for two sites. And they were like, hey, man, I know we stopped working together, but are you available? And then can you quote these like however many sites they had him quote? He took on two of them. Turns out it's him, his son and the girlfriend. So now you're running two large commercial sites with three wow. people. I don't <laughs> think so, man. No. So by the end of that, they had somebody else, like they gave him all the warnings in the world. And yeah. then they had somebody else come in to quote, finishing his job yeah. and their quote to finish it, I think was five or 6,000 less than his entire quote. So yeah. he did all that work for free, paid for all that yeah. material by himself. Like, and, and I mean, like you said, bankrupting people to make money sucks, but on the same hand, if you're not doing what you say you're going to do and you're being sneaky the other way, that's yeah. punishment. That's punishment yeah. for bad deeds. Yeah. And if, if, if you're taking on shit that you shouldn't be taking on, you know, and like not Seems knowing true. that process to price jobs properly and like to be able to complete them. Yeah. It goes, it goes both ways. They should have known that the guy's price was super low to begin with and not give him the work, but like he totally. also shouldn't have been pricing that type of work. Right. And yeah. like stupid on both their parts. And all it did was fuck up the project. Yeah. Killed my time. It, right. Yeah. Killed the timeline. Now the owner's got all these extra financing costs and everything else. So like, just, it's just a mess all around. And I, I've honestly seen it happen so many times and it's so stupid. Um, another good question. I, well, I don't know if it's a good question. I think it is. Uh, so somebody's not doing level five because they haven't, they don't know how to do it or they are not doing specialty peds because they don't know how to do it or they haven't done it. How, what would your suggestion be to like somebody new? How do you go about doing that? Cause you can't just do it at your house. Like at some point you have to take a job that has one of these things that you've not done before. So how would, how would you suggest somebody approach that? 
like there, there's a couple of ways you could shoot a really high number at it yep and not get it or that's true <laughs> right <laughs> or if you, you know a lot of people do that they'll shoot a high number of shit and like oh if i get it i get it i don't i don't you know it's not the yeah. best way to do business burning like, leads man yeah what, what i would do is be honest and be like hey i haven't used this before like i'm gonna kind of like you know figure out my time what i think it would be i'm kind of taking a stab in the dark mm -hmm. uh, if i don't do great i don't do great i'm learning right? I'm not going to make you pay me more because I'm learning. Yes. I'll, I'll take the hit on that. And I've done that lots of times, you know, like I, no one taught me how to estimate. I figured it out on my own. Yeah. And a lot of it was trial and error. Like my first job that I ever did, um, was for $800. Okay. And I, I fixed up this, uh, upstairs of this lady's old farmhouse. I fixed up the old plaster. I, First job I priced, I said 800 bucks to do it. I was there all week. I had two guys come help me. Yeah. Oh, I, I didn't make a, a goddamn dollar, right? Yeah. I had to borrow my mom's car to get to the job. I had to put gas in it and fill it up when I was done. And like, I had to use my hourly money for my hourly job to uh, to pay for all that. And then to pay these guys, and like the 800 bucks was gone. But I gained mm -hmm. so much experience on that first job. Totally. Yeah. So put in the, you know, put in the time to learn. Like people shouldn't be paying you to learn. They, they will a little bit, you know, yeah. that's the good thing about construction is we do get paid to learn, yes. but a lot of guys want to make way up here to be taught when like, if you could just work here for a bit, you'll get there. Like what's mm -hmm. that saying? Uh, uh, do more than uh, you're paid for. Mm -hmm. and soon you'll be paid for more than you do. Yes. I like that. Same, same philosophy. Right. So good. Great question. Yeah. I did. So that, that's exactly how I did it. Is yeah. I would just tell people like, hey, you want different corner beads, right? And I wouldn't charge any more for it. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to do it. I have no idea how long it's going to take. It's going to be yeah. perfect by the time I leave, though. Yeah. And like, do you have wiggle room in your timeline for that? Or, yeah. or you know, what are the, can I do extra hours? Like, can I put in 12s instead of 8s? Yeah. And we'll get all this done. And then you kind of can, if you're paying attention, figure out how long it took figure then, out like how how long did the last 50 feet of it do yes because because realistically out of a couple hundred feet that's yeah. really where where your line is because now you've done a couple hundred feet yeah you kind of you get it um yeah. you know fresco is another one of those things can i just do a wall yeah like, I'll, I'll just do it and see how it goes yeah and then and uh track, track that so that now you know hey i did it you know in this amount of time Here's my price. You know, now I've got a linear foot price. Now I've got a square foot price or whatever that is. Or like, and you know how much you can do and then price a little bit more of it, get that work mm -hmm. and then fine tune that even more so that, Hey, maybe you just found a fucking niche, right? Maybe exactly. Arm is your niche. And like you're beating other guys and other guys, well, I don't know how he does that for so cheap. Well, yeah. you just like, you really niche down on that and you've got it down to a science and that's your specialty now. Yeah. And it's, it, it's, I, the reason I asked that question is because it's hard to just look at people and be like, oh, you just eat shit. Uh, <laughs> you just eat shit and you lose. And that's how you figure these things out. So I'm, I'm yeah. always interested to like <laughs> see what other people think, because um, you're absolutely right, though. For some things that I've not done, I've thrown a huge number at it and I've just not got it. Yeah. And then you it's missed just, out on that opportunity, yeah. right? Where it's like, I'd rather go into low number and sit and figure out what do I think I could do this for? And like, even say like specialty beads, like you do like mm -hmm. a niche bead or something like that. Well, you've probably done square bead. Yeah. Probably done bull nose, yeah. right? And you kind of know how much longer it took to do the bull nose. So if you're like, okay, I'm, you know, I'll just use a hypothetical number. If I'm a buck a foot for square bead and I go a buck 50 for bull nose, well, shit, I bet you if I go two bucks for niche bead, I can make it work. And maybe I don't do amazing, but I'll figure it out. Right. Right. Very simple strategies. But a lot of times guys just don't want to fucking think about it. They get no. scared and they just like throw a number. I had a, a mentor one time actually that uh, we were going to do a job together. It was this big job. And we were going to team up on it. Two mm -hmm. companies team up. And uh, I was going over the pricing with them. And it was getting really close to the closing time. I'm like, fuck, I got to get through this. Like, we're not done yet. He's like, oh, just uh, throw 10 bucks a square foot at that area. I'm like, we'll call it a day. That should cover it. I was like, what? Fuck, man. You've been doing this for like 40 years, dude. And yeah. that's what you're still doing? Like, come on. That sounds crazy. And that's that's just what some guys do. And you win, you lose. Who knows what happens, right? I'm very precise. And that's what I teach people in my programs. How to yeah. be precise with the estimating so that you're like super confident 
with your numbers going yeah. into something because a lot of guys aren't they throw high price they throw low price actually my, my first client there Salim from bear drywall uh he was not confident in his pricing yeah. and he would go in he'd give a price he didn't really know what he was doing so sometimes he shot high sometimes he shot low he didn't really have a system for it and then the homeowner would be like oh well, can you do it for this much or can you knock 1500 dollars off and he just want the job and say yes yeah. then he do the job and realize it cost me money to do this thing in the end or like I made $300 on that job. Like yeah. what a waste of my time. Yeah. It's a little crazy. And and the amount of people that like, you know, finders fees is another one of these things where like you want 10%. Okay. Mm -hmm. But like, is it being priced plus 10%? Yeah. Because your 10% might be most of the profit. Yeah. So now you're doing all the work for nothing. Like yeah. that, that doesn't make any sense. You're, and that goes back to, yes, you're being paid for your time, but your business isn't making any money yeah. because you've just handed over all the profit to somebody that found you the job. And unless you're going to get into the business of stealing clients, that's never going to change. Yeah. So it's, yeah, that's uh it's, it's a tough deal, man. This is really cool what you're doing because there are people out there that just want to work, man. You yeah. like I I I don't want to do all this extra bullshit. I do because I'm good at it or or whatever. Yeah. But yeah. um, you know, nobody wants to. And no. and when when there's a shortcut, and then so do you do like monthly check-ins and all that other kind of stuff as well? Like, how does that all work? Like when somebody or do they just purchase the program from you and then uh, no. like they so you give them the toolbox? There's, there's actually a lot going on that I'm building out right now. Everything is not launched yet, but within the next couple of weeks, it will be. Right now, I've just been doing one-on-one -on -one coaching. We're yeah, like, cool. we're jumping on a Zoom call. We're running through the program together. I meet with guys every week for an hour. They've got access to me all week. Like they message me, call me, whatever, if they're having trouble. Mm -hmm. What I'm switching to though is like being able to take more people in because right. I've seen such um, like a, a like outreach like coming in um, looking for help. Some right. people, it's it's been insane how many people have been reaching out to me looking for help. So I've created a community that I'm going to join all my coaching clients to, right. and it's it's almost like a Facebook group, but not like a, like a school group. I don't know if you ever done anything on school. It's similar right. to that where everybody can everybody can come in and be a part of this community and it's about the drywall business rather than drywall workers because i think we've done that a lot already on instagram mm -hmm. including mm -hmm. people into running tools like drywall nation did a great job bringing that community together totally but there's nothing to do with the business side of the things so that's what i've created is i'm starting this community uh people will be able to come in and be a part of this community and then i have my training course in there with all my recorded modules that they can go through and then uh we have a group call every week as well and yeah, you've got opportunity to book in with me direct too if you need extra support. So the group calls are going to be great. I've been in a bunch of coaching programs myself, so it's structured similar. The group calls are amazing because, like, you know, somebody else asks a question, and you're like, I'm not really there yet, but like, fuck, that's that's good to know, right? Or like, gonna listen, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good to like and to see that other people are going through some of the same struggles that you are, yeah. and like, you know, they don't know how to get leads, then they're struggling with the money or you know, they're struggling with the estimating process or whatever that is. You can see other people are having the same issues as you. And yeah. I think that's like, that's super powerful to have that, have that community and uh, to be open and honest about what you're going through. Right. Cause yes. you know, what's going on in a lot of people's lives and businesses, they're not talking about, you know, like the CRA is down their back or the IRS or wherever you are. And uh, you owe hundreds of thousands of dollars. Maybe I know lots of guys where they've been running for years and they hadn't paid the tax man. They literally owe hundreds of thousands of dollars and that's like on their shoulders. Right. And they see no way out and they can't tell anybody about it. It's embarrassing. And they just mm -hmm. keep trying to work and they jump company to company. So the government can't catch up to them. That's so crazy. It's good, to get, it's good to get that out there. I was in the same position, man. Like I opened my business. I didn't pay taxes for three years. Really? All of a sudden tax man reached out and they're like, you owe all this money. And, it was a scary process and like I ended up paying it off, mm -hmm. but it was wild. It was like a hundred grand. Whoa. Yeah. It was, it was nuts. All this money I owe because it was uh right when it switched from GST to HST. Oh, okay. So it went from the 5% to the 13% and then I never paid any of the HST and right. I had my biggest year. I did like $400,000 of my third year or something. <laughs> I never paid any of the HST and I owe this like uh 
all these other taxes and like it was a mess. And then uh, WSIB came after me because I had employees that uh, I paid as subcontractors. It should have been employees. So then I like, right. had to pay back all this back WSIB. And it was like 12, 13% back then. Wow. It was, it was quite a bit. Yeah, it actually it went down a lot in recent years. Roofers used to be like 18%. So I had all these bills that just came at me that I had no goddamn idea about, you know, and I had to deal with it. I literally had nobody to talk to about it. Yeah. No one. So that's a big part. If anyone's listening out there, that's like going through that type of shit. Cause I know that there is like, you're not alone. I've been there. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's lots of other people that have been there. Like it is a thing. And like, there is a way out, you know, like if you finally, like you got to deal with it. That's the thing is most people just like look the other way and they don't deal with it, but yeah. you got to just get on the phone, talk to the CRA or hire an accountant bookkeeper. They'll have do them it do your, it. They'll do it on your behalf, which is like awesome. You know, and they'll set up a payment plan with you and find a way to get that thing paid down and get that, get that off your fucking plate. Cause that is like terrible to go to bed with every night. Yeah. That's been my biggest focus since I started the company is how I sleep at night. Mm -hmm. because I, I will work real hard all day long, but I need to be able to lay down in bed and go to sleep, sleep well, know that yeah. I've not, you know, I'm not looking over my shoulder when I leave the house. I'm not like worried about if so-and-so talks to so-and-so because you, you, how could you possibly focus on work yeah. if, if that's the life that you're living? Right. And, and it's gotta be terrifying. Um, you know, this, this little community that we're building, man, it's like, being more open about things, especially on the podcast. We talk a lot about mental health on the podcast. We talk a lot about like how and what, and if you feel like you're drowning, like all those types of things, like everybody mm. feels that man. Like yeah. you're, you're watching people online fucking kill it. Yeah. And then, and then you're sitting there drowning going, I'll just never be like that. Those guys are drowning too, man. And they, like they, they might owe the government all kinds of money and they just don't talk about it. And that's the whole thing. And it, the, the exciting part for me anyways about this podcast is the business side of everything because nobody is talking about that. Yes. Um, you know, if you if you are killing it on a personal basis, like your work is spectacular and like your family life is good and like everything is coming up Melhouse, you know, and, yeah. um, you know, your bank account is in, in terrible order and your taxes are fucked and like, you know, you, you can't afford certain things like that is all the same kind of pressure as like being depressed or dragging yeah. your feet or all those types of things. Like you have to have all of these things in line. And I think that's kind of what you were talking about with building the foundation from a business yeah. standpoint of like, it is so important. Yeah. Yeah. More, more work's not always going to solve the problem. Right. So like if no. you do owe taxes, like build that foundation, get in touch with an accountant, a bookkeeper, have them talk to the tax man on your behalf and like, start figuring that shit out because the more that you ignore it, the bigger the bill gets. Right. Like if you've ever had a call from like the CRA collections people, holy fuck, man. It's I bet like it's not call pleasant. From the mob, man. Like it's, it's wild. Like if it was in person, they'd probably break your legs. Like it's crazy. They want their money and they want it now and they scare you and you're like, you're in a fucking panic, you know? Yeah. Like it's, it's terrifying. Like someone's calling you, you owe all this money and they just base it all on assumptions. So if you like filed your taxes two years ago, well, like they'll base it on that and like uh, just come up with their own calculations and send you a notice of assessment. I know somebody I was actually talking to yesterday and he got a notice of assessment that he owed $53,000. They said he didn't file his taxes. He actually did file them and he was supposed yeah. to get a fucking return. But they said, no, you didn't file your taxes. You owe $53,000. It is collecting interest. There's been this much of the interest already and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, dude, it's terrifying. And I'm like, I don't know what to do. Like, do I call my accountant? Like, what is, what is going on here? You know? Yeah. So it's, it's happens to a lot of people, even by mistake. Like he says, he's filed his taxes and they say he hasn't. So he's got to now try and deal with that and fight that. And that is, that's a stressful thing, man. To like, owe someone $53,000 when, you know, you don't have any money in the bank. You're like yeah. kind of paycheck to paycheck, or maybe you do have a little bit of money, but you don't have 53 grand sitting around yeah. that you want to get rid of, you know? Well, that's a year's salary for somebody working a regular job, man. You yeah. got to work and not spend a penny. Like you're going to yeah. save every cent that you get and you're just going to hand that over. What about next year? Like you got to pay those taxes too, right? That, that is yeah. a terrifying thing to think about. Yeah, it's it's scary, man. I went through it. Like I said, I owed $100,000. My accountant told me to claim bankruptcy. That was their advice. 
Really? Like, oh, you'll never pay this off. Claim bankruptcy. It's a hundred thousand dollars. Fuck, I want, I want to buy a house, man. I was young, right? Yeah. I was third year in business. I want to buy a house. I'm not claiming bankruptcy. So I literally just I started taking side jobs. Mm-hmm. And I don't I was already running a business, but then I was like literally subbing off of other drywall companies. I go do it evenings and weekends. Mm-hmm. I just took on as much work as I could and I paid it off in a year. Yeah. And wow. It, was, it fucking killed me. I ended up getting shingles at 25. Like, okay. Because <laughs> because of the stress and me like trying to work so much and pay this down, but I literally paid it off in a year and like I'm like never again. Let's let's yeah. stay on top of this shit, right? Like that almost fucking killed me. And you know, if if I shared everything I went through in business of how I've got here, it's yeah. like so many stories like that that should have killed me. I should have quit. I probably should have just went and did something else, but I just like I just kept pushing through and it ended up working out, but it hasn't been easy. Um, I think there's easier avenues. And I think what I'm offering now is really going to help people to avoid a lot of those pitfalls that I went through because I learned the hard way. I touched the stove. It was fucking hot and I don't want to touch it again. And I want to help other people not touch that thing because it's, uh, it can be painful. Okay. So I'm sure there's some people out here going, okay, so like, how do I start? So the, like, walk me through that process. Somebody that's listening to this and wants to get a hold of you and do all of that. Like what happens next? Easiest way, just like shoot me a DM on Instagram. I'm okay. at real Doug McKenzie. I'm sure you'll, you'll link it up here mm-hmm. uh, when, when you post this, reach out to me on Instagram and I will walk you through the process. We can jump on a call, go over everything I'm offering, find out where you're struggling so I can, you know, see where I can help the most and most quickly and come up with a plan with you of how we can, you know, fix these problems that you're having because that's the thing like a lot of guys are having problems in their business and you know whatever that is they they think it's hiring they think it's leads it's they don't have enough money it's cash flow like there's issues and usually the issue that they think it is it's like four other problems right they're just not looking at those things it's like building that foundation so that we can fix this one problem and then go you can't just fix this problem and go because you've got a rocky foundation right so that's the simplest way. Reach out to me on Instagram. We'll go over everything and uh, we'll get you rocking. Yeah. That's super interesting, man. Well, I like what you're doing. Yeah, I think it's needed. There's not a whole lot of it and, and it's not snake oil. Right. And I think there's a lot of that out there where there it's, you know, you have people that are not running $6 million businesses or, or whatever. Yeah. And, and they're out there talking about it. Well, giving advice and trying yeah. to run coaching programs. And I've seen a lot of it and like, I was in some coaching programs myself. Luckily I haven't got like ripped off kind of deal by somebody. But the problem was is the coaching programs I were I was in, they were very generic. Right. Whereas like you're with plumbers, electricians, carpenters, like there is some general contractor like programs. Uh, but they didn't really work. Like I, d- I did get a bunch of stuff, but not everything I needed. So right. I've like channeled what I've learned from the different coaches I've had, um, which were contractor coaches just like life business coaches. I've literally used a, a coach to start my coaching business. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, like there's coaches that help coaches. So I have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on coaches to help me get to where I am. And that's uh, how I put this program together is like amalgamated all that information that I've learned and put it into a package that I can share with other people. Awesome. Um, do you know when your podcast with Nick's coming out? Probably next couple of weeks uh we just shot it today what's today wednesday i think it comes out next friday so he'll start uh leaking out on monday it makes me so happy that this is going to come out before that does it come out before yeah dude when's this, when's this come out this this will come out on sunday on sunday okay yeah. so kind of similar and then he he'll start advertising it on uh on monday that it's coming out on friday so sorry nick um <laughs> that's so funny i had no idea I, uh, when you and I started talking, I, I was like, I think that that's a good idea. You guys, you guys um, both kind of reached out like same time. And I was like, yeah. the way we were t- both talking, it was like kind of working out to the same week. And I'm like, I should just do both of these in the same day. That's hilarious. Like, let's just, let's just get them both out there. Like that'd, yeah. that'd be great. If I'm spending the day, I might as well, uh, I might as well just do it. So super awesome that you guys have st- both started like driving that's cool. podcasts. Like yeah. I've been saying that's needed, you know, for quite some time, somebody needed to do that. So super glad that you guys did and you're able to bring on like a lot of different people and like you know talk about tools and business and mental health and like all the things you guys are talking about is really really good i think it's neat um i i you know like i i've always referred to his as like the game and mine as like the locker room after the game 
yeah uh you know where like he he really likes to dive in and like figure out who you are and what you're doing and all that kind of stuff and like it used to be sporadic all over the place and I, I, if I really enjoy somebody's podcast on Nick's, like, I know who you are. I know what you're about. Like, you're going to be a good fit for this one. I'll reach out to them and be like, yo, man, you want to come hang out? And yeah. it, it it is much nicer to listen to his first and then have another with somebody. Typically, if somebody comes on here first, at least for me, and they've not been anywhere else, having them come back is always the better one because you've already got a relationship with somebody you already kind of figured it out you've been talking for a little while maybe afterwards and then when they come yeah. back it's just a hangout it's super comfortable yeah um yeah so that's really cool man you just spent the whole day doing podcasts that's not too I bad I, I literally did two podcasts today i had a sales call at one and we closed a two million dollar job this morning boom crazy and now yeah. i'm actually taking my wife out for a date tonight and uh, good for you man yeah yeah, I can cram a lot in a day, man. <laughs> no shit. Yeah. yeah, well, it seems like you got everything together, man. It's uh, It was a pleasure having you on. You got anything, yeah, else, uh, anything else you want to talk about? No, no, it's, yeah. it's been fun, man. Perfect. This has been great. All right, everybody. Um, if you're not following him already, the real, uh, just real Doug McKenzie uh, on Instagram, um, you can reach out to him and... Uh, you know, ask any questions that you need or, or do whatever you want or just follow them to support, do whatever you want to do. Uh, be humble, treat everyone the same and do your fucking job.